Aye, we are much obliged to him for it. Order! Questions to the Prime Minister. Stephen Doughty. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, Mr Speaker, first of all, I'm sure that the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to our former colleague, Paul Flynn. He was an outstanding parliamentarian, a tireless campaigner, and championed his constituency of Newport West and Wales with energy and enthusiasm for over 30 years. Paul spent the vast majority of his career as a backbencher and wrote a helpful guide in his book, Commons Knowledge, How to Be a Backbencher, uh, before being made Shadow Leader of the House and Shadow Secretary of State for Wales. But of course, he will be remembered for one of the great parliamentary quotes when he left Labour's front bench in 2016. He said, Our glorious leader, in an act of pioneering diversity, courageously decided to give opportunities for geriatrics on the front bench. And this was so successful that he decided to create opportunities for geriatrics on the back bench. I'm double blessed. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Stephen Doughty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I add my tribute to those words of the Prime Minister for my uh, former constituency neighbour, friend and uh, Welsh Labour colleague, Paul Flynn. Um, he was a remarkable man. He will go down as one of the great parliamentarians the last 40 years and was an inspiration to many of us. He gave me once a copy of that book when I was a teenager, so he must have seen uh, something in me, Mr Speaker. So... I'm, not, I'm rebellious, maybe not quite as rebellious as him, but, um, uh, but um, Mr Speaker, um, he was a great man and he will be missed by all of us. Um, Mr Speaker, um, in the midst of political crisis, it is ever more important that we put our country first. With thousands of jobs at risk and with our international reputation in question, will the Prime Minister now stop playing Russian roulette, rule out no deal and put a deal back to the British people so they can have the final say. Prime Minister! uh, Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, as he knows, that there are two ways in which it's possible to ensure that we don't see no deal. Uh, No, but one is is to stay in the European Union, which is is not what the referendum result said, and the other is to agree a deal. And what I'm working on at the moment is taking the view of this House of Commons uh, about the concerns of the backstop in the deal and working with Brussels to resolve that issue such that this House will be able to agree a deal. Theresa Villiers. Mr Speaker, this afternoon this House will debate anti-Semitism. And with that in mind, I quote from the statement of the Honourable Member for Enfield North, who explained Labour inactivity on this issue as that given a choice between the sport of anti-Semites and ridding Labour of Jew hate, they have decided to side with anti-Semites. In the light of that, will the Prime Minister join me in urging Labour to rid their party of this scourge once and for all? Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to my right honourable friend that I think this is a very important issue that everybody in this House should take seriously? I never thought I would see the day when Jewish people in this country were concerned about their future in this country. And I never thought I would see the day when a once proud Labour Party was accused of institutional anti-Semitism by a former member of that party. And, And it is incumbent on all of us in this House to ensure that we act against anti-Semitism wherever and however it occurs. It is racism and we should act against it. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I start by joining what you said on Monday in paying tribute to my friend and yours, Paul Flynn. He served in this House for over 30 years as Member for Newport West. He was courageous, he was warm, he was witty. And, as the Prime Minister pointed out, when he served briefly on the shadow front bench, he came to the first shadow cabinet meeting and welcomed to me my diversity project to promote octogenarians to the shadow cabinet. His book on how to become an MP is absolutely a must read. He was respected all across this House and I think we're all going to miss his contributions and his wit and his wisdom. Our deepest condolences to his wife Sam and all of his family and all of his much wider family all across Newport and all across Wales. He was a truly wonderful man and a great and dear friend. 
I also hope, Mr Speaker, that the House will join me in paying tribute to Baroness Falkinder, who died earlier this month, and sending our condolences to her friends and family. When Marsha served with distinction as political secretary to Harold Wilson, she was subjected to a long campaign of mis misogynistic smear and innuendo, and I think she suffered a great deal as a result of it. And we should remember the great work she did as political secretary to Harold Wilson. The Prime Minister responded just now to a question on anti-Semitism. I'd simply say this. Anti-Semitism has no place whatsoever in any of our political parties, in our life, in our society. Uh, Mr Ellis. Be quiet now and for the rest of the session. You used to practice as a barrister. You didn't make those sorts of harumphing noises in the courts, or if you did, no wonder you no longer practice there. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. As I was saying, Mr Speaker, it has no place whatsoever in our society or in any of our political parties, and my own political party takes the strongest action to deal with anti-Semitism wherever it rears its head. Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, last week an EU official said the UK Government was only pretending to negotiate, adding there was nothing on the table from the British side. So with just 37 days to go, can the Prime Minister be clear, what she, will she actually be proposing today when she travels to Brussels? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, first of all, of course, there are a number of meetings taking place in Brussels. My right honourable friend, the Brexit Secretary and the Attorney General were in Brussels earlier this week and had a constructive and positive meeting with officials in the European Commission on the issue of alternative arrangements and work on alternative arrangements. Uh, the issue that I'm taking to Brussels is the one I've been speaking to EU leaders about over the last few days, and that is the concern that was expressed in this House of ensuring that we could not find ourselves in the current backstop indefinitely. Uh, there are a number of ways that I've identified on a number of occasions at this dispatch box to deal with that. I've referenced the work on alternative arrangements. Uh, uh, there is also the uh, options of an end date or a unilateral exit mechanism, uh, legal work, uh, uh, those, what matters in all of this is legally binding changes that ensure that we address the concern that has been raised by this House. That is what I will be discussing with the European Commission and will continue to discuss with them and European Union leaders. Jeremy Corbyn. Sounds like it might be quite confusing for the European Union to understand exactly what the Prime Minister is turning up with, actually. <laughs> Um, Mr. Mr Speaker, she's had three groups of backbenchers working on, on, on three proposals. Firstly, to remove the backstop. Secondly, to make the backstop time limited. And thirdly, to give the UK the right to exit unilaterally. So which of these proposals is the Prime Minister negotiating for today? One, two or three? Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Gentleman uh, points out that, as I have said, I've just said in my uh, opening response to his question, he could have listened to that answer, uh, but I'm happy to repeat it, there are a number of ways in which it is possible to address the issue that has been raised by this House of Commons, uh, and work is, on, is uh, being undertaken on those various issues. So on the alternative arrangements, for example, while the Commission has raised questions, particularly about the extent to which derogation from European Union law Law would be necessary in order to put those into place, and there's a concern about being able to achieve that if we're going to leave in time. If we're going to leave in time, nevertheless, we have agreed that a work stream will go forward on those uh, on those matters. We're also exploring the other issues, but the point is a very simple one. It isn't just a question of saying to the European Union. Actually, this is just the one thing. It's a question of sitting down with the European Union and finding a solution that is going to deliver for the people of Northern Ireland and Ireland, that is going to ensure that we deal with the concern that has been raised here in this House of Commons, and that is going to enable a deal to be brought back to this House of Commons, which this House of Commons can support, so we leave on the 29th of March with a deal. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn. This week, the Foreign, of a Foreign Office Minister said categorically, we're not leaving without a deal. But sadly, he doesn't speak for the government. Her business minister says he's very conscious of the damage of not ruling out a hard Brexit is having on business and industry. People's jobs and livelihoods are in the Prime Minister's hands. Will she stop playing games with people's jobs and make it very clear that no deal is absolutely ruled out? Yeah. Prime Minister. People's jobs and futures are in the hands of every member of this House. 
once again, the right honourable gentleman could have listened to the answer that I gave to his honourable friend in the uh, first question that he asked. There are only two ways to take no deal off the table. One is to back a deal. The other is to revoke Article 50 and stay in the European Union. Now, he's refused to back a deal, so the obvious conclusion is that he must want to revoke Article 50. So he can stand up now and tell us what his policy is to back the deal or stay in the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn. Well, I did write a very nice letter to the Prime Minister setting out what our views were. I'm sure she received it and read it, and I hope she's going to think on it. But it appears, Mr Speaker, that the Right Honourable Member for West Dorset is right when he said last week, this Government and my Prime Minister will actually prefer to head for the exit door without a deal in the event her deal does not succeed. And he went on to say it's a terrifying fact. Mr Speaker, thousands of car workers in Derby, Sunderland, Birmingham and Swindon are facing redundancy. Does that matter to the Prime Minister? Prime Minister. I say to the right honourable gentleman, first of all, first of all, we have seen decisions taken by car manufacturers, uh, and of, obviously the decision this week by Honda is one that is deeply disappointing. They have made absolutely clear that this is not a Brexit-related decision. This is a decision. This is a decision about the change that is taking place to the global car market. Jobs, of course, matter to this government. And while the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to talk about jobs, perhaps he would like to change the habit of a lifetime and stand up at that dispatch box and welcome the excellent job figures under this government that we've seen this week. Well, the Prime Minister doesn't seem very interested in listening to those companies and industry bodies that say they need a customs union. And when she talks about jobs, will she also talk about those doing two or three jobs to make ends meet, those on zero hours contracts, those are so low paid they have to access food banks just to survive, those suffering from in-work poverty under her watch, under her government. Last year, investment in the car industry halved. Brexit uncertainty is already costing investment. And where investment is cut today, jobs are cut tomorrow. Mr Speaker, that uncertainty wouldn't end even if the Prime Minister's rejected deal somehow or other got through because it promises only the certainty of a spectrum of possible outcomes. So will the Prime Minister see sense and offer business and workers the certainty, the certainty of a customs union that could protect jobs and industry in this country. Prime Minister. What the right honourable gentleman will also have heard from car manufacturers is their support for the deal that the government negotiated with the European Union. But if he wants to talk about jobs, I'm very happy to talk about jobs. Because what have we seen in the latest figures? Employment at a record high. Yeah. Unemployment at its lowest since the 1970s. 96% of the increase in employment in the last year has come from full time work. Youth unemployment has almost halved since 2010, and female employment is at a record high. But what did. Oh, it's all very well shouting from the front bench. Let's look at what record we saw under the Labour Party in government. Order, order, Mr. Lavery, calm yourself. You have applied for, to be a statesman, but there is an apprenticeship, and you have to undergo it, and it is not assisted by that sort of sedentary ranting. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, I beg your pardon, the Prime Minister is continuing her answer. Mr. Speaker, so let's look at the record that the Labour Party had in government in terms of employment. Yeah. Unemployment rose by nearly half a million under the Labour Party. Female employment, female employment rose by 26%. Youth, female unemployment rose by 26%. Youth unemployment rose by 44%, and the number of households where no one had ever worked nearly doubled. That is a record of a Labour government where the working people pay the price of Labour. And Mr Speaker, child poverty halved under the Labour government. We invested in Sure Start in children's centres. We invested in a future for young people. She should get out a bit more and hear the anger of so many young people around this country of what they are suffering from now under her government, under her watch. 
The chair, Mr Speaker, of the manufacturers' organisation Make UK said yesterday, I'm saddened by the way that some of our politicians have put selfish political ideology <laughs> ahead... You should, hear, you should hear the rest of it first. Ahead of the national interest and people's livelihoods and left us facing the catastrophic prospect of leaving the EU next month with no deal. The Society of Manufacture Motor Manufacturers and Traders, Food and Drink Federation, National Farmers Union and the CBI all want a disastrous no deal ruled out. Along with the TUC, along with the TUC many also support the UK being in a permanent customs union. A little over a month ago, and this government has failed to put a little over a month ago, and this government has failed to put the country first. The crisis of jobs going, industries under threat, and the Prime Minister indulges in what our own business minister calls fanciful nonsense. When, when is she going to put the interests of the people of this country before the interests of the Conservative Party? Prime Minister. To the right honourable gentleman. There is, there is. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he has consistently put uh, his party political interest ahead of the national interest. He has. We can, we can take no deal off the table by agreeing a deal. Yet at every stage, he has acted to frustrate a deal. He has acted to make no deal more likely. But that's not surprising from this Labour Party. Because what do we see from his Labour Party? Hamas and Hezbollah friends. Israel and the United States enemies. Hatton a hero. Churchill a villain. Attlee and Bevan will be spinning in their grave. That's what the Right Honourable Gentleman has done to a once proud Labour Party. We will never let him do it to our country. Speaker, my right honourable friend will know from shelter that many people in receipt of benefits are blocked from renting in the private sector. These people are often carers or have a disability. I know Number 10 is working with shelter to resolve this problem. Will the Prime Minister give all her officials her support to resolve this pressing issue? Yeah. Prime Minister! Uh, say to my honourable friend, he's absolutely right to raise this issue. We are working with shelter on it. I do uh, urge that work to go ahead and to be to a fruitful conclusion. Can I also say to my honourable, uh, my honourable friend that actually this is an issue that one of my local councillors, Stuart Carroll, has raised with me, and uh, I know he has come in to work with Number 10 as well on this issue. It's an important issue. We're working on it, and we look to find a, a, a satisfactory resolution of it soon. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for the sad death of Paul Flynn? He will be missed by many, and thoughts and prayers are with Sam and his family. He was a unique and a truly gifted parliamentarian. It was a pleasure to serve on a committee with him. It was a pleasure to have known him. Mr Speaker, Westminster is broken. We are in the middle of a constitutional crisis on the brink of a Brexit disaster. And yet, this place is at war with itself. The Tories and the Labour Party are imploding. Scotland deserves better. We need a way out. Time is running out. Will this House get to vote on the Prime Minister's Brexit deal next week? And if not, when? Yeah. Prime Minister! To the, uh, to the right honourable gentleman. Obviously, we're in these discussions with the European Union, and uh, we will bring a vote back to this House when it is, been, when it is possible to bring a vote back, that, uh, to bring a deal back that deals with the issue that the House of Commons has raised. We've listened to the House of Commons, we're working on the views of the House of Commons with the European Union, and we'll bring a vote back when it's the right time to do so. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, quite simply, that is not good enough. Time is running out. Three and a half thousand jobs lost from Honda. The NFU says a no deal Brexit is the stuff of nightmares. 100,000 jobs in Scotland under threat. Prime Minister, you are bringing the UK economy to its knees. How many warnings? How many jobs? 
how many resignations will it take the Prime Minister to stop this madness? If you don't act, Prime Minister, Scotland will. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, uh, can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we see debt down, deficit down, jobs up, taxes down. Oh, taxes down. Not in Scotland, of course, but the SNP are putting, uh, are putting taxes up. And, and if, uh, if, he, if he says uh, it's not good enough, I'll tell him what's not good enough. It's an SNP that wants to take Scotland out of the United Kingdom, knowing, knowing full well that being a member of the United Kingdom is worth £1,400 every year for each person in Scotland. He talks about damaging the economy. The only people who are going to damage the economy in Scotland are sitting on the SNP benches. Leo Doherty. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, join me in thanking the Home Secretary for making it very clear that those who join or support terrorist organisations abroad do not deserve British citizenship and that this government is not a soft touch for terrorists? What can I say to my I think it is an important message for us to uh, give that we are very clear that we will take action against those who are involved in terrorism. Obviously, the question of uh, deprivation is one that each Home Secretary deals with on a number of occasions. I've dealt with deprivation cases myself. There's a very clear set of criteria on which the Home Secretary considers that matter. But the overall point my honourable friend makes is absolutely right, which is how important it is for this government and this country to make very clear that we will take action against those who are involved in terrorism. Eleanor Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Before I go into my question, could I just say about Paul Flynn, a colleague? I went to Bangladesh with him, and he, him and his wife, and it was absolutely lovely. He's a very nice person who surely will be missed. Can I give my condolence to his wife, Sam, and hopefully she'll get in contact with me as soon as we can. Thank you. Right. Prime Minister. <laughs> right. 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 Heidi Prescott is a little girl who lives in my constituent. She was born with a rare muscular wasting spinal disease called spinal muscular atrophy. She is 10 years old and her condition is worsening. Heidi is now losing the ability to walk and is spending most of her time in a wheelchair. There is a treatment which could help Heidi to slow down the de deterioration and prolong her life. It's called Spinraza. It's not available in England, but will be in Scotland in April 2019. Can I ask the Prime Minister, why can't this treatment be accessible to my constituent, yeah. Heidi, and other children in England with this disease? Yeah. Prime Minister. To the Honourable Lady, obviously she's raised a particular case about Heidi, her constituent, and uh, obviously I'm sorry to hear that, that Heidi is in these circumstances. The question of the drugs that are available and the treatments that are available, obviously we do have a robust independent process in through the NICE reviews to look at new medicines that are uh, possible, and this is the case with Spinzara. Uh, I'm pleased that Biogen have actually submitted, as I understand it, a revised submission for the NICE appraisal committee to consider, and that a meeting has been arranged for the 6th of March. March, uh, um, under which those recommendations will be considered. Sir David Amis. Parliamentarians yeah. should be horrified that any human being would spend the night sleeping on a pavement. And in that regard, would my right honourable friend take the opportunity, <coughs> borrowing the visit from the uh, relevant Minister for Derbyshire, that South End Borough Council, together with its associated bodies, has reduced a rough sleeping by 85%, and that's another reason South End should become a city. <laughs> and, and, will, and will the government do all it can to address issues of alcohol abuse and mental health? Yeah. Prime Minister. Friend, that uh, well done for getting in his bid for South End once again to be a city. In that he raises very important issues. We are addressing these issues of alcoholism and mental health, and of course, often these are issues that are 
uh, uh, connected where people do find themselves homeless or, or rough sleeping. Um, he, I'm happy to congratulate South End Council on the work that they have done to reduce rough sleeping in their area. I'm pleased to say that the rough sleeping initiative which the Government has introduced is where we're working with local authorities with the highest levels of rough sleeping has seen in those areas rough sleeping falling uh, by 23%. So action is being taken, it is having an impact, of course there is more to do and we do focus on those issues which uh, underlie the problems that those find themselves rough sleeping uh, are experiencing. Matthew Penniker. Yeah, Thank yeah, you Mr yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hundreds of leaseholders in my constituency and many thousands more across the country yeah. are not only still living in privately owned buildings covered in dangerous Grenfell style cladding, they have no idea whether they will have to pay the full costs of remedial works and interim fire safety measures. Yeah. I'm sure the Prime Minister will tell me that she expects building owners not to pass on these costs and that nothing is ruled out. But all my constituents want to know is when will the government act to make private owners pay rather than just continue to ask them nicely? Yeah. Minister. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman, he's, he's, uh, I think he has heard me respond on a similar issue on this uh, before, because we have repeatedly called on private building owners not to pass costs on to leaseholders. As a result of our interventions, 216 owners have either started, completed or have commitments in place to remediate, and 50 are not cooperating, but we're maintaining pressure on those and we rule nothing out. We have established a task force to oversee the remediation of private sector uh, buildings, and that is actively working to do just that. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sometimes our public services fail to provide our military personnel, the veterans or their families, with the support that they need, and they have nowhere to take their case for arbitration. Would the Prime Minister meet with me to discuss my campaign to create an Armed Forces Covenant Ombudsman so that those who have served our country will know they are valued? Well, can I, can Prime I first Minister. Of all thank my friend for the way in which she has worked to champion the Armed Forces Covenant and the interests of the Armed Forces? And of course, we should all recognise the sacrifice and dedication of our Armed Forces and the work they do for us day in and day out. I'd be very happy to uh, meet with uh, my honourable friend and discuss the proposal that she has. Tonia Antoniazzi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, alongside the tributes paid to our late dear colleague, Paul Flynn, I hope she will join me in recognising his dogged determination in his fight for the legalisation of medicinal cannabis. Since November, however, the rescheduling of medicinal cannabis hasn't changed anything. Not a single new NHS prescription has been issued, causing the families of children with epilepsy, in particular, unbearable (laughs) suffering. It's evident that someone somewhere is blocking it. But did the government mean to block this life-changing medicine to these children? And if not, what will they do about it? Prime yeah. Minister. The Honourable Lady, that of course the government has taken action in relation to the issue of uh, medicinal cannabis. Um, but the important thing is that decisions are taken on the basis of clinical evidence and taken by those who are best able to take those decisions rather than simply, uh, rather than simply being taken by government ministers. So a process has been put in place to ensure that where there are cases, those cases are looked at, they are looked at very carefully, and decisions are properly taken by the clinicians who are best placed to do so. Philip Hollabone. The Home Secretary is to be congratulated for his swift and decisive action in removing British citizenship from Shamima Begum. But the fact remains that of the 900 British nationals who have gone to support Daesh, fighting against British armed forces in Iraq and Syria, only 40 have been prosecuted. With 400 of these individuals set to return back to this country in the very near future, will the Prime Minister revisit the provisions of the Treason Act to make sure that these appalling activities receive suitable and just punishment? I say to Minister. You, I'm obviously, our priority is ensuring safety and security here in the UK. Uh, and we also recognise that anyone who's travelled to Syria has not only put themselves in considerable danger, but potentially poses a serious national security risk. And any British citizen who does return from taking part in the conflict must be in no doubt they'll be questioned, investigated and potentially prosecuted. It is right that we follow that process, but I'm sure my honourable friend will also accept that one of the issues in looking at prosecution is ensuring that there is evidence to enable prosecution to take place. 
Um, but decisions on how people will be dealt with are dealt with are taken on a case by case basis to make sure the most appropriate action is taken. And of course, what we are doing is ensuring in every decision that we put the protection of the public and the safety of the public first. Tom Bray. The Prime Minister is correct. History will judge us all. History, history will judge us all. And those in positions of authority will be particularly harshly judged. People like the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for dividing the country and dividing their parties. So will the Prime Minister finally rule out no deal and stem the bloodletting in British jobs, dismiss the nonsensical notion of a jobs first Brexit and extend Article 50 to enable the people finally to vote on what is the sole justification that she sees for backing Brexit, and that is the will of the people. Can I say to the right Prime Minister, if he is so concerned, if he is so concerned about ensuring that we don't leave the European Union without a deal, then he has a simple route through it, and that is to back the deal that the government brings back from the European Union. Sir Oliver Heald. Prime Minister, join me in paying tribute to my old friend Steve Diamond, a haemophiliac uh, sufferer who was infected with uh, blood which was contaminated. He fought bravely for many years, uh, tw over 20 years, showing great bravery and also resilience and was supported throughout by his wife Sue. Um, he was very grateful when the uh, inquiry was set up, the Langstaff inquiry, and does she agree with me that it is vital that all the necessary NHS documents uh, and all the medical notes which may be needed by that inquiry are available to it so it can be fully comprehensive? Well, first Minister, I uh, join my honourable right friend in paying tribute to Steve Diamond. Um, the contaminated blood scandal was an appalling tragedy. It should never have happened. And it is vital that victims and their families who have suffered so much get the answers and justice they deserve. And they have waited, as we all know, they have waited dec decades for this. I am assured by the Department for Health and uh, Social Care that they have sent thousands of documents to the inquiry already and will send more when necessary. But we are committed to being open and transparent with the inquiry, and we have waived the usual legal privileges to assist the process. It is important that this inquiry is able to get to the truth. Phil Wilson. Yeah. Prime Minister, since 2010, Conservative governments have taken £6 billion out of the North East. Can we have it back, please? <laughs> Prime Minister. Can I, say, can I say to the honourable gentleman, this is, this, is, this, is, this is a government, this is a government that, is, that is ensuring that we're working across the whole country, that we're delivering an economy for everyone across the whole country. And, uh, and he talks about billions of pounds in relation to the North. He might, just, he might just want to reflect on the £13 billion being put into transport in the North of this country. Field. Prime Minister, join me in welcoming Councillor Anne Meadows, who has today left the Labour Party in neighbouring Brighton Hove, has crossed the floor, joined the Conservatives, who are now the largest group on Brighton Hove Council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Party is because of the rise of anti Semitism and bullying that she and her colleagues have experienced under momentum activists. So much so that only seven of the 23 councillors there will be restanding in May. Does the Prime Minister agree that now anti Semitism is rife throughout the whole of the Labour Party? Yeah, Minister. Can I, first of all, agree with my honourable friend? As she says, a long serving Labour councillor, Anne Meadows, in Brighton and Hove, has today chosen to leave Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party and join the Conservatives. And that's due to the bullying, due to the bullying and anti Semitism she has received from momentum and the hard left. And that's the harsh reality that decent, moderate Labour councillors are having to face every day due to Jeremy Corbyn's failure to stand up to bullying and racism in his party. And we welcome her with open arms into the Conservative Party. I'm sure she will be an excellent Conservative councillor. Rosie Duffield. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have a constituent who has left doubly incontinent following a serious and very violent sexual assault. She previously had a lifetime award of disability living allowance. However, recent PIP assessments have concluded that she is not 
entitled to oh, DNA or the mobility okay. components of Pip, despite this extremely difficult condition dominating every aspect of her daily life. Will the Prime Minister please ask the Secretary of State to look urgently at the DWP's failure to recognise the impact of this very serious condition? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Minister, the recognise that I'm not able to respond to the individual details of the case at the dispatch box, but but I will. I will ensure that the Department of Work and Pensions and the relevant minister looks at that case and responds to the Honourable Lady. David Trudini. For improving mental health care has rightly become a priority for the government. But can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, tell us, is the government doing anything to improve the situation for, for, concerning mental health for NHS staff who are hard pressed and deserve support? Yeah. Well, the minister this is an important point because obviously uh, our dedicated NHS staff day in and day out are delivering unwavering commitment in caring for us all and obviously it is necessary that we ensure that their mental health is, uh, is looked after. We are setting up a dedicated mental health support service which will offer NHS staff confidential advice and support 24 hours a day. It will be staffed by qualified professionals who have uh, had training in situations that are unique to the National Health Service and will ensure that mental health referrals from either a GP or an occupational health clinician for NHS employees are fast-tracked. It is right that the mental and physical well-being is at the forefront of our health service. It is right that we are taking this action to support uh, our dedicated NHS staff. Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Local Government Association has identified a potential £1.6 billion deficit for special needs education, but the government's responded with a paltry £350 million. So as a result, head teachers in my Brighton constituency are literally having sleepless nights. Vital reading, reading programmes for children with SEN are being cut. Crucial support staff are being lost. So instead of repeating her usual line on schools funding, will she agree to meet a delegation of head teachers from Brighton so she can hear direct from them about the real pain that's being caused? Can I say to Minister. the Honourable Lady, uh, first of all, I'm sure the Honourable Lady is, uh, will look forward to working well with the largest group on Brighton and Hove Council now, the Conservative group on Brighton and Hove Council. Um, she raises this issue about education funding. She refers to answers I've given in the past because we have been putting more funding into, uh, into education. We have been doing that in a number of ways. We have uh, uh, announced extra support, as she said, for children with complex special educational needs. And that's building on the £6 billion which is in place for that this year, the highest level on record. The Honourable Lady says it's not enough, but it is the highest level on record. And we are also putting money into new school places and better facilities for children with special educational needs. Robert Goodwill. Thank you. Communities up and down the country are installing defibrillators. Uh, the village of Brompton in my constituency has one in a former telephone box, a stone throw away from the main road, but not directly visible from it. Does the Prime Minister think it would be a good idea if we had a nationally approved defibrillator road sign so that these life-saving devices could be quickly accessed in the event of an emergency? Prime Minister. Can I commend the action being taken in my right honourable friend's constituency? I see the same action being taken in my constituency of people uh, ensuring that defibrillators are available. He's raised a very interesting point and I'll ask the Department of Transport to look at it seriously. Lyndon. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, recent research from the charity Bliss shows that two-thirds of dads have to return to work whilst their premature or sick babies are still in the neonatal intensive care unit. So if the Prime Minister thinks this is unjust, will she work with me to ensure that we change employment law and make sure that the dads and parents of yeah. premature babies yeah, like yeah. myself yeah. get the support they need to support their families? Yeah. 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 Minister! Say, gentlemen, obviously I know this is an issue that is close to the heart of many members, but particularly close to the heart of, of the Honourable Gentleman. And uh, I know that he has met with ministers to discuss this issue last year. Um, officials in Bayes are undertaking what is a short, focused internal review of provisions for parents of premature, sick and multiple babies to obtain an understanding of the barriers to participating in the labour market. They are working with organisations such as Bliss, The Smallest Things and Tambor 
to better understand these issues, and they've held focus group with a number of parents. And they've offered to discuss the conclusions that are reached with those interested parties in due course, and I'm sure we'll be happy to meet with the Honourable Gentleman to discuss this and taking this forward. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister will be aware that the British Army has engaged in a recruitment campaign in Commonwealth countries. However, it is the case that only after soldiers have signed up for minimum four-year contracts do they find out that they are not allowed to bring their children to this country. Given that these are brave women and men who are prepared to put their lives on the line for us and our country, I hope the Prime Minister will agree with me that this is something that needs to be looked into urgently. Will she therefore kindly agree to meet with me and others concerned to see how this matter can be progressed? Minister. My right hon. Friend, that the the issue, I'm aware of the issue that he has raised. I'm told by the Ministry of Defence that they do make sure that information is available to individuals about what their situation will be. Um, But I know that this is a matter that obviously crosses, it's not just of of, uh, concern uh, to the Ministry of Defence, obviously the issue of the immigration rules rests with the Home Office as well. And if, uh, and I will certainly meet with my right hon. Friend and discuss this issue. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seventy per cent of flights are taken by fifty. 15% of the population, yet the Tees Mayor has just spent up to £90 million of taxpayers' money buying an airport when most people across the area can't get a bus home after 6.30 at night. Could you help them out? Yeah. Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I, mean, I recognise the importance of buses to our communities. We've been spending £250 million every year to keep fares down and uh, maintain an extensive network. And the Honourable Gentleman might like to know that actually since 2010 we've seen 10,000 new routes across the North and the Midlands and live bus services, live local bus services registered have increased 15% in just the last two years. Roger Gale! Speaker Paul Flynn was in his time a valued member of the United Kingdom delegation to the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. And I know that colleagues on both sides of the House who serve on that body would like to join others in expressing our condolences to his family. Mr Speaker, my armed forces constituents will be pleased to know that with effect from the start of this year, ex-service men and women will receive ID cards. Will my right honourable friend join me in expressing the hope that in time that card will become a passport to public recognition of some of the bravest and finest in our country. To my honourable friend, we we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the ex forces community, and we are working hard, uh, as he's indicated, to ensure that they receive the support that they deserve. As he says, any personnel who left the military since December 2018 will automatically be given one of these new ID cards, which will allow them to maintain a tangible link to their career and uh, uh, in the forces. But as my right honourable friend, the Minister for Defence People and Veterans, said. These new cards celebrate the great commitment and dedication of those who have served this country, and I hope they can provide a further link to ex-personnel and the incredible community around them. And I hope they will, as my honourable friend shows, uh, says, be a sign of the incredible valour that those ex-servicemen and women have shown. Andrew Regal. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2017, during the election, we learned what the Prime Minister's definition of strong and stable was. (laughs) As our automotive industry disintegrates before our eyes, as investment is put on hold, as growth slows, are we now learning what the Prime Minister's definition of smooth and orderly Brexit is? (laughs) Prime Minister! To the Honourable Lady, as I say to every member of this House... There will come a further point in this chamber when every member will have a decision.
Order. Urgent question. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Prime Minister to make a statement on the economic impact of her government's proposed deal for the e- UK exiting the EU. The Treasury and Paymaster General, Minister Mel Stry. Mr Speaker, thank you. At the end of November, the Government published our analysis assessing the economic impact of leaving the European Union. It not only included an analysis of the Government's negotiating position as set out in the July 2018 White Paper, but it went further still and considered three other scenarios, a free trade agreement, an EEA-type relationship and a no-deal scenario. Specifically, the analysis showed that the outcomes for the proposed future UK-EU relationship would deliver significantly higher economic output, about seven percentage points higher than the no-deal scenario. A no-deal scenario which would result in lower economic activity in all sector groups of the economy compared to the white paper scenario. Mr Speaker, that is why we should pass this deal to avoid no deal and support jobs and the UK economy. In publishing this work, the Government delivered on its commitment to provide an appropriate level of analysis to Parliament. In addition, this House has has had plenty of opportunity to debate both the analysis and the deal that is on the table. As the Prime Minister has said, we will bring a revised deal back to this House for a second meaningful vote as soon as we possibly can. In the meantime, Mr Speaker, it is right that the Government is afforded the flexibility and space to continue our negotiations. This is because the agreement of the political declaration will be followed by negotiations on the legal text. The UK and the EU recognise that this means there could be a spectrum of different outcomes. Mr Speaker, we need to approach these negotiations with as much strength as possible. The focus must now be on the future, planning and prioritising that which matters. Mr Speaker, let me remind the House. We will have an implementation period, a new close relationship with the EU and, crucially, the ability to strike trade deals around the world, bringing back control over our money, borders and laws, to mould a prosperous and ambitious new path for our country and on our terms. No matter what approach we take, the UK economy will continue to be strong and grow into the future. Um, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have to say with respect to the Minister, and of course this was a question to the Prime Minister, and it's the Prime Minister that should be answering. This is a matter of the utmost importance, because this House is going to be asked to vote on the Prime Minister's deal. And the specific question that was asked is the economic analysis that this Government has done on its deal. And it's quite clear from the answer that the Minister has just given that the Government has done no analysis on this deal. And the most important matter that arguably that this House has voted on since the Second World War, we don't have an economic impact a statement from this government. Mr Speaker, that is once again this Conservative government treating this House, treating the United Kingdom with contempt. And it's a disgrace that the government has continued to duck and dive its responsibilities. Mr Speaker, economists are clear. The PM's deal is set to hit GDP, the public finances and living standards. An analysis published by the LSE estimates the Brexit deal could reduce UK GDP per capita by between 1.9 and 5.5% over 10 years, compared to remaining in the EU. The National Institute of Economic and Social Research have warned that if the government's proposed Brexit deal is implemented, then GDP in the longer term will be around 4% lower than it would have been if we stayed in the EU. The Bank of England analysis states that the government's deal will raise unemployment by 4% and inflation by 2%. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister is running fear of the truth, with her government refusing to admit the damage that her deal will do. The government cannot claim that its November document covers its deal. Let's look at the facts. Page 17 of the Treasury analysis looked at the modelled average free trade agreement and it states, as such, it does not seek to define or model a bespoke agreement. But, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister tells us she has a bespoke deal. The Treasury analysis continues. 
This scenario is not indicative of government policy, as it would not meet UK objectives, including avoiding a hard border in Northern Ireland. There we have it, in black and white. The Treasury analysis conducted last year does not account for the Prime Minister's deal. So I say to the government, where is the analysis? MPs continue to be expected to vote on the proposed deal without the government explaining the economic consequences, the height of their responsibility. Mr Speaker, this deal would be a disaster for Scotland, taking us out of the EU single market and customs union. We know that up to 100,000 jobs in Scotland are under threat. This government is sticking its head in the sand. Everyone knows that this government is bringing our economy to its knees. We cannot allow the Tories to drive us off the cliff edge. No government can be allowed to bring forward a vote on such a significant matter without an economic assessment. It must be published. Shame on the Prime Minister if she fails to protect our economy. Shame on those on the government benches if they allow businesses to collapse and jobs to be lost. And shame on any MP, including the Leader of the Opposition, if they march through the lobbies to deliver a deal that secures economic catastrophe. Mr Speaker, no member should believe this is a binary choice. It is not. There is not a choice, there is not a choice of no deal or this deal. Both are bad. Both will plunge our economy and turn a mitigated disaster. Order. Just before I ask the Minister to reply, I very generously did not interrupt the flow of the Right Honourable Gentleman's eloquence, or indeed, for that matter, the eloquence of his flow. However, by way of a public information notice, can I say to the House, and it is not directed particularly at the Right Honourable Gentleman, because I have seen this burgeoning phenomenon in recent times, that an urgent question is supposed to be that, not an urgent oration with whatever rhetorical force and insistence it is delivered. It is supposed to be a question, and I have noticed over recent times an increasing tendency on the part of members who have secured such, courtesy of the chair, to launch into a lengthy preamble, sometimes constituting the entirety of their remarks. So for future reference, because in future I will have to cut people off if they abuse, however inadvertently, the parameters. It is supposed to be a question. A sentence of preamble is one thing, but thereafter a member should put a series of inquiries to the Minister on the Treasury bench. But we'll leave it there for now. The Right Honourable Gentleman has made his point, but I know that he won't misbehave again. (laughs) Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for his vociferous uh, oration? Uh, But vociferous orations do not serve as any substitute, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid, for the facts. And I need to remind the Right Honourable Gentleman of some of the facts in respect of the points that he made. He says, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that we have uh, made uh, no uh, analysis. Uh, of the impact of these uh, arrangements on the United Kingdom economy, and that is simply not the case. The uh, uh, information that we have come uh, forward with is a very robust uh, analysis uh, of the uh, future outcomes of the four different scenarios which we uh, consider uh, in that analysis. He levels the charge, Mr Speaker, that we are uh, treating the United Kingdom in some way with contempt. That is certainly not the case. This House has been very deeply preoccupied with the matters uh, of Brexit and the nature of the way in which we may uh, exit the European Union. And Indeed, the Prime Minister has set out that there will be further debate uh, uh, this time uh, next week to be followed in the event that we don't have, uh, haven't passed a meaningful vote with a, another uh, amendable motion before this House. Uh, the Right Honourable uh, Gentleman uh, also says that uh, the, the deal, as he terms it, would have a negative impact on the UK economy. Well, what the analysis clearly shows is that under every single scenario that it analyses, it is better to have this deal uh, than no deal 
or any of the alternatives. And finally, Mr. Speaker, he made the observation that, or decried the fact that we had not put forward a bespoke deal uh, for analysis uh, within uh, our analysis. And that really, Mr. Speaker, uh, is to illustrate um, the lack of understanding that the Right Honourable Gentleman has as to what the future political uh, declaration is all about, which is a range of possible outcomes. And that is entirely uh, what this analysis models. Mr. Kenneth Clark. <coughs> Perfectly obvious to all those involved in the negotiations, both the British negotiators and the EU negotiations, that uh, if Britain were to leave the EU with no deal, it would be disastrous for the British economy in the medium to long term and extremely damaging to the economies of many EU countries, particularly those the nearest to the UK. So, will the Minister accept that it is rather silly uh, to think that it's useful in these negotiations to take up the simplistic view that we have to pretend that we're threatening to leave with no deal uh, in order to improve our bargaining position. <coughs> Will he uh, reassure me that the negotiations are proceeding on the basis that both sides know they don't want no deal and they're therefore trying to limit the damaging consequences of risking that. And really what we should pursue is retaining the benefits of the customs union, the benefits of the single market, and the continued free trade with our largest customer in the world, as it's always going to be, which is being urged upon us by every industrial leader in this country. Well, my right honourable and learned uh, friend, Mr Speaker, is entirely right that a no deal would be a very unsatisfactory uh, outcome. Uh, but of course what the House will appreciate is that the only way of avoiding a no deal is to secure a deal and that is why the Prime Minister will be shortly returning uh, to Brussels to have further uh, discussions uh, with the EU Commission and Jean-Claude uh, uh, Juncker in pursuit of a deal. Jonathan Reynolds. Yeah. 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 Speaker, for over two years businesses and trade unions have called for clarity about the Government's Brexit deal. And for two years, there's been nothing but delay and a total lack of clarity. What's been clear, though, from the wide range of independent analyses that we've received, is that the government's Brexit deal is not good news for our economy. Even the government's own modelling said that the economy would be nearly 4% smaller if the government's deal went ahead, equivalent to £83 billion if it happened today. So it's no surprise that the Prime Minister's deal has struggled to command any widespread support, leading to the largest ever defeat in the House of Commons. And the climate of uncertainty created by the government's Brexit blundering, especially the refusal to take no deal off the table, first of all led to businesses delaying investment decisions, but now decisions are being taken, but as a result of that uncertainty and insecurity, the decisions are to cut jobs and to cut investment. And the result, as the Governor of the Bank of England has told us last month, Business investment in 2018 fell by 3.7% in year-on-year -year terms. So let's go through some of those decisions. Jaguar Land Rover has cut 4,500 jobs. Ford has cut 1,000 jobs in Bridge End. Honda's Swindon closure, not supposedly related to Brexit, will mean 3,500 people lose their employment. And in financial services, HSBC has announced it will move seven offices from London to Paris in 2019. Deutsche Bank has said it is considering moving 75% of its balance sheet from London to Frankfurt. But this isn't just about Brexit. It's about how the government has failed to produce an economic plan that tackles our productivity crisis and increases investment for the long term. It's a government putting our economy at risk through failed management and failing to secure a Brexit deal that would protect jobs and the economy. So can I ask the Financial Secretary? Firstly, what has happened to the promise of frictionless trade? Secondly, where is the detail businesses need about the promised customs arrangements? Thirdly, can the government tell us at all what is the mysterious technology that will facilitate the government's proposed customs arrangements? Why has the government failed to even mention in the future partnership agreement the issue of intellectual property restrictions? And can the government confirm there has been a dilution of protection for road hauliers and passenger transport operators from the earlier checkers commitments? Mr Speaker, it is the role of the Government's Treasury team, above all others, to stand up to protect our economy. It is though the Chancellor has simply gone missing. But the Government has run out of time. We cannot wait any longer for the answers we need, 
and the country cannot wait any longer for the answers it deserves. Well, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman uh, accuses uh, this side of the House as having a lack of clarity around the issues uh, of uh, Brexit, and I find that slightly rich coming from the Labour front bench. Uh, given the position that the Leader of the Opposition has flip-flopped around uh, as to whether to be within or without of the uh, Customs Union, whether or not to uh, uh, honour the uh, pledge that he appeared to make at his party conference for a second referendum, which appears to have been parked uh, now. It does uh, seem to me, uh, Mr Speaker, that the Opposition are trying to ride uh, at least two horses uh, on this issue, uh, if not more. And we know what happens when you do that. It tends to get rather painful. Uh, in the end, as we are perhaps seeing in more recent uh, events. He refers to the parliamentary uh, defeat uh, that the Government uh, suffered uh, more recently. He chose to overlook the fact that the House did unite around a particular way forward, and that is to seek changes to the uh, backstop arrangements, which is uh, the main focus now of the negotiations that are continuing uh, in uh, Brussels. Uh, He referred to various impacts of uh, employers and uh, changes and the impact on the economy and employment, and that gives me a good opportunity, Mr Speaker, to remind him of some of the facts, that we have about the highest level of employment uh, in our history as a country. We have the lowest level of unemployment Sid, the, uh, since the mid-1970s. Uh, we have halved youth unemployment since 2010. And lest it be forgotten, of course, we know that with every Labour government in history, they have always left office with unemployment higher than it was when they entered office. Sir John Redwood. Will the Treasury issue a codicil or clarification on its economic forecasts Looking at what happens if if we leave in March under the managed WTO model when we spend the 39 billion plus of the withdrawal agreement on boosting public services and boosting our economy at home, we were bound to be better off. Isn't that true? I think an important point to make about the the, the modelling is to recognise that it is on the basis of the uh, status quo, so the model would not take into account the kind of factors that. Uh, the right honourable, my right honourable friend has raised, or indeed changes in productivity or trade flows uh, and, and other uh, uh, factors, and the, it will be really for individual members to, to assess uh, those particular issues, the ones that he has raised in that context. Hilary Ben. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. Things have come to a pretty pass. When here we are, 37 days from Brexit, and the House of Commons is actually discussing which of several options, all of them economically damaging, we should choose for the future of our country's economy. Since it is the government's policy that it is planning for a no-deal Brexit, could the Minister explain to the House what possible justification there is for that, given that its own economic assessment shows it would have the most damaging impact on the British economy, how could such an act of economic self-harm ever be justified? Well, um, what the Right Honourable Gentleman overlooks is that whilst he is absolutely right that no deal, in essence, is something to be avoided and indeed is not in the interests either of the United Kingdom or the European Union, that is not the same thing as saying that we should be reckless and not make sure that we're prepared for it should it happen. And that is precisely what we are doing. Sir Michael Fallon. Would the Financial Secretary undertake to publish to the House, in good time for the meaningful vote, the decisions that he and his colleagues are currently taking on the tariffs that would apply in the event of no deal? including which industries would be protected, at what rate, and what the impact would be on prices. Well, Mr Speaker, um, tariff uh, policy in the event of no deal is clearly something that we are heavily engaged with. He rightly identifies the aspect or element of tariffs that relate to protecting uh, domestic producers, and that, of course, will be a very important part of the considerations that we are undertaking at the moment, and we will come forward to the House in due course with the details of those tariffs. Mr Vincent Cable. Brexit uncertainty is one of several factors contributing to the crisis in the car industry, which uh, previous governments, Conservative, Labour and Coalition, did so much to promote. 
Uh, can the government say what assurances they have had from Toyota, BMW and Vauxhall that they are not going to follow the pattern of disinvestment that we are now seeing? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman's uh, question will be most appropriately directed towards the uh, Bayes Department as to the specifics of the companies that he has listed. But I think uh, Honda, uh, uh, which is a company that has already been uh, raised uh, uh, in in this particular uh, respect, has made it clear uh, that it is not a consequence of Brexit that is causing them uh, to take a decision to depart the United Kingdom. It is more to do with changes in international uh, international around cars and the uh, position of diesel uh, in that respect. And, of course, the deal that Japan has struck on zero tariffs uh, in a few years' time for uh, exports from Japan into uh, the European Union. Sir Desmond Swain, what would be the economic impact of membership of a customs union where access to our market was traded to a, conceded to a third party without any reciprocal arrangement of our access to theirs? Well, my right honourable friend asked a very specific and uh, interesting question, which begs, I think, many other uh, questions as to exactly uh, the form of the model uh, that uh, he is uh, uh, postulating. The important thing when it comes to access to our markets, Mr Speaker, going forward, is that we have a tariff policy that both uh, protects uh, those uh, domestic producers in our economy where they require uh, protection, also ensures that our trade remedy uh, regime is robust so that we can uh, prevent the dumping of products into the UK market, but also uh, is sufficiently liberalised such that the, um, uh, uh, the, the cost uh, uh, savings that would accrue to uh, liberalised tariffs uh, is there for the benefit of both consumers and for those who use those products in the production process that they have within the UK market. Helen Goodman. Mr Speaker, I'm sorry that the Honourable Member for Broxtow isn't in her place to ask this question herself, but last week she withdrew her amendment asking the Government to publish their papers on the impact of no deal. Is the Government still going to hold to that promise, even though she has defected from the Tory party? The analysis that the Honourable Lady uh, refers to, of course, is contained within the uh, cross-government analysis which we are discussing as part of this urgent question. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Treasury's forecasts before the referendum were woefully inaccurate and the OBR was set up specifically to stop politicised reports coming out, would it not be better to consult a newspaper horoscope than Treasury forecasts? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I hate to disappoint my honourable friend and genius, though, and amusing, though, uh, his question is, but I should point out just one fallacy in the premise to his question, which is that these are not forecasts. Yeah. 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 Ian Paisley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the search for a withdrawal agreement that we can all support, can the Minister now confirm if draft proposals have been put forward to Europe that have put in place or have drafted a legally binding textual change to the withdrawal agreement? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, we have made it clear that our ambition is to uh, strike an amended deal uh, with the European Union so that we put beyond doubt this issue of how permanent or otherwise the backstop arrangements Uh, might be. Uh, I am not uh, in a position to comment on the specifics of these negotiations that are ongoing at the uh, moment because I am not intimately uh, involved with them. Kirsten Hare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we know that the economic impact that was done, assessment that was done on the Chequers deal, showed that there would be no um, there would be no impact on growth in Scotland. But does the minister agree with me that nationalists have made it very clear that they will accept no deal that's put on the table? Because I know the minister knows, my constituents know, businesses in Scotland know that this is all just to cause the ultimate chaos to pave the way for independence. Correct. What the analysis uh, shows is that under all the scenarios uh, being considered, including Uh, no deal. Uh, It is the case that a deal based on the uh, 2018 uh, white paper 
will result in a better result for our economy for every sector, for every region and for every country, including Scotland, of the United Kingdom. Mark Francois. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Chairman of the Select Committee said, today is D-37. So in some five weeks from today, we will have honoured the wishes of 17.4 million UK citizens and left the European Union. But military veterans living in Cyprus will also be affected by some of these changes, not least because we recently signed a double taxation treaty with the Cypriot government. The Minister personally intervened in that negotiation to allow a five-year transition period for military veterans receiving state pensions to have longer to adjust. He played a blinder on Honoured the Covenant and on their behalf may I thank him for today for everything he did to look after them. Well, can I very sincerely, Mr Speaker, thank my honourable friend for his extremely kind words. He is, as ever, overly modest. Uh, it was not, uh, indeed, uh, uh, all my effort that secured the result that we achieved for those very important veterans uh, in Cyprus. It was uh, the honourable gentleman who raised this issue, brought it to my attention in committee, and worked so hard with me to make sure that we achieve the right, just, and desired outcome. Yeah. Stephen Dowdy. Of course, the economic effects are already being felt already. In my own constituency in Cardiff, South and Penarth, I've spoken to businesses that have gone from profit to loss, others who are cutting investment. And I spoke to Cardiff University this week who cited Brexit as a factor in the job losses that they are now proposing. This is very, very serious. So will the Minister just accept? You know, let's get serious here. They know, the Ministers know that no deal would be a catastrophe. They know that every single Brexit is going to lead to a worse economic outcome for this country. So will they just accept that this issue needs to go back to the people and let them decide based on the facts? Well, the, the, the Honourable Gentleman uh, raises, if I may summarise his point, as uh, uncertainty is not good for business. Isn't he? he is entirely right. And that is all the more reason why we should get behind the deal, get the deal sorted. We would then have an implementation period in which nothing will change until the end of 2020 and the businesses to which he refers in his constituency can then start to take on more employment and invest going forward with confidence. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are a great many voices in the international investor community who are very clear at the moment that the underlying fundamentals of the British economy remain sound, but they do warn that we are in a period where investment decisions are being put on hold, trade deals are, are being put in abeyance. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the single most important thing that we can do right now to unlock new investment into the economy is actually pass the deal? Yeah. Well, my right honourable friend uh, hits the nail firmly on the head. Um, what we must do to uh, move on from uncertainty, to move into a situation where we can start to concentrate on our, uh, negotiating our future relationship with the European Union, whilst everything remaining stable and the same until the end of 2020 is past the deal, as he suggests. Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. The uh, fundamental problem with the British Government's policy as it stands is that the deal only offers certainty for the duration of the transition period. And therefore, due to the chaos within the Conservative Party, isn't it the case that all the deal does is move the cliff edge to the end of the transition phase? <laughs> no, uh, not at all, Mr Speaker. What, what the deal would do uh, would be to firstly resolve uh, the three critical issues which are the, uh, upon which the withdrawal agreement uh, focuses, namely uh, the Northern Ireland Ireland uh, border, uh, the situation as it relates to EU and UK uh, citizens, and of course the financial uh, arrangements that we will enter into as we leave uh, the European Union. But what it will also then critically give us is the time to put into effect the political declaration, which is the other part of what has been negotiated, and that would give us time until the end of 2020 to do that. Kevin Olin Ray. With the Scottish economy now growing at half the rate of the rest of the United Kingdom, can my right honourable friend offer any advice on economic growth to the government north of the border? Yeah. Well, the advice, um, although I, I doubt very much, Mr. Speaker, that the Scottish National Party, Party will take much advice from me. 
But my advice would be, firstly, get behind the deal and let's get certainty and let's increase investment. And secondly, accept the results of the 2014 referendum. Stay with the United Kingdom. Don't end up in a situation where you're actually creating a border between the country of Scotland and uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. Megilia. Mr Speaker, in response to the Chair of the Brexit Select Committee, the Minister said it would have been reckless of the Government not to plan for no deal, but the detailed work of the Public Accounts Committee has clearly shown that the Government isn't prepared for no deal and it is woefully prepared for a deal. So wouldn't the responsible thing to do to now to delay any exit or extend the transition period and take stock and make sure that that D-37 uncertainty that is hanging over our country is resolved. It's too late to just pass the deal now. The uncertainty is now built in. Mr Speaker, I don't accept that we have not uh, uh, adequately prepared or are not deeply preparing uh, for the possibility uh, of a no deal. This work has been going on for many, many months and to a, a far greater depth than, than, than many uh, have actually appreciated. In my own area of ministerial responsibility, HMRC and borders, uh, we have now staffed up. We've got 4,500 uh, more personnel uh, ready for this work. There will be over 5,000 in place uh, by the 29th of March. We have engaged with stakeholders right across the piece in terms of making sure that we have the most facilitated uh, possible uh, customs arrangements in place particularly in respect of the short straits uh, crossing Dover and Calais uh, and so on. So an immense amount of work uh, has been carried out. Gavin Foster. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. In considering the economic impact of the proposed deal, has the Secretary of State re re reflected on that actually the key drivers of our economic performance are the policies we decide domestically around productivity, around our business structure, our tax structure? And we need to look at what the SNP is doing in Scotland to realise where we could go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, I, I won't get drawn into the Scottish National Party again, um, uh, other than to thank my honourable uh, uh, friend uh, for his question. And he is absolutely right. Fundamentally, uh, the way in which we manage the economy is one of the most important things that we do as a government. That's why we have record levels of employment, why we have the lowest level of unemployment since 1975, why we halved uh, youth unemployment since uh, 2010. We've reduced the debt, reduced the deficit by 80%. And why the economy is moving in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie Abrams. As many honourable friends have said, all credible economic analysis uh, shows that a no deal Brexit would be disastrous for the economy, and this draft withdrawal agreement would only be slightly less disastrous for this economy. Uh, given the um, Resolution for, uh, for, uh, Foundation's report today, which predicts an increase in child poverty by 6% by 2023. That's equivalent to an additional million children living in poverty uh, since 2016. What, are the, what is the Minister's estimates of the additional uh, effect on child poverty that a no deal or this draft withdrawal agreement would have on child poverty? Absolute poverty, uh, Mr Speaker, is at a record low. This government has an enviable record of, of helping uh, those that uh, require work to get into work, and I've already at length outlined our success in that area. We have also made sure that work pays in terms of the benefit system and our rollout of uh, universal credit. But underpinning the Honourable Lady's question is a denial of the result of the 2016 referendum. The country took a decision to leave, and on that basis, the decisions have to be whether we have a sensible deal as we've negotiated or whether perhaps we end up with no deal that I think the vast majority of this House would not want to see happen. Stephen Kerr. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend knows, and I know the people of Scotland know, that the SNP government, by their refusal to contemplate any form of withdrawal agreement whatsoever, are deliberately dragging Scotland to a no-deal situation, a crisis of their making, which they would then use as a platform to demand independence. What possible excuse, to, to the best of my right honourable friend's knowledge, what possible excuse does the First Minister of Scotland have for not attending the Prime Minister's Brexit cabinets? 
Well, it is for the First Minister of Scotland, Mr Speaker, to answer for herself as to the reasons why she attends uh, the the, the functions and the the, the, the points that uh, my honourable uh, friend has made. But there is no doubt, Mr Speaker, that this is a matter that affects the entirety of the United Kingdom, including Scotland. I believe that the vast majority of us in this House wish to avoid a no-deal Brexit. And the Scottish National Party could play a very pivotal and important role in helping us to avoid that by supporting the negotiated deal. Marcia de Cordova. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is no secret that this government's deal will hit people's livelihoods, jobs and economic growth. And all credible economic analysis has said that a no-deal Brexit would have a devastating effect. With just 37 days to go, will the Minister agree now that we need to get serious and they need to consider extending Article 50? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, m- m- Mr Speaker, um, the Honourable Lady asks or urges us to get serious. We have been extremely serious at uh, negotiating a deal with the European Union for a very considerable amount of time, and we are continue to be engaged upon, uh, upon that uh, endeavour. And where she is absolutely right is that we all, I think, most of us in this House, wish to avoid a no deal. But the way that we will do that is by members on the opposition benches and our members on this side uniting together and making sure we avoid no deal and we have a good deal for our country. Tom Brake. Now, we know the government have done no uh, economic impact analysis of the proposed deal. Has the Minister perhaps done some economic analysis of the Secretary of State for International Trade's failure to secure the 40 trade deals that he had promised, uh, those rollover trade deals that will be signed one minute after 11 o'clock on the 29th of March? Yeah, come on. Well, the honourable ge- right honourable gentleman says that we've done no analysis of uh, the deal, as, as he refers to it. As he will know, the deal is actually the political uh, declaration, and that uh, in- inherently, inherently would include a range of particular uh, possible outcomes for that deal. And that is something uh, that is modelled within the sensitivity analysis, within the analysis that we have brought forward to Parliament. Well, uh, Mr Seeley, sit down, young man. Sit down. Sit down. It's very discourteous. The father of ours comes in. Oh, don't sit there looking at your phone, man. I'm speaking to you. Show some respect and manners in the chamber. No, I don't need the honourable gentleman to get up, remain seated and behave with courtesy. What on earth's got into you? Who's next? Chris Elmore. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. As the Minister will know, of all the European funding that comes to the UK, 23% of it goes to Wales. The Minister said that discussions on the Shared Prosperity Fund would start before Christmas. I'm wondering if he's been played any part in that. Leave campaigner said that Wales would not be a penny worse off if we were to leave, to you, leave the European Union. So can the Minister set out how the fund will work, who will make decisions to ensure the Welsh economy doesn't tank if we are to have this botched Brexit deal? Set out those uh, details, as the Honourable Gentleman will know in due course. It's very, not really a matter of order, but very poor taste. Uh, and I expect somebody as culturally sophisticated as the Honourable Gentleman to behave better than that. Uh, Alison Thewlis. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The Scotch Whisky Association recently reported that the value of Scotch whisky exports to Mexico last year was £131.5 million, up 18.5% in 2017. And it is the fourth largest export market by volume um, for Scotch whisky. But the Parliamentary Under Secretary for State for Exiting the EU has confirmed by letter to the Procedure Committee that the Government does not, does not um, expect to replicate the existing Mexico Spirits ah. Agreement in time for March the 29th. Yeah, yeah, what assessment has he made of the impact that this will have on geographic indicators for Scotch whisky and on the wider Scottish no. economy? Yeah, yeah. What I would say, uh, Mr Speaker, is this Government totally uh, understands and gets the significant importance of Scottish whisky uh, exports, not just to Scotland, but into the entire United Kingdom, where Scots, uh, Scotch whisky uh, exports account for some 20% of all exports of food uh, and drink uh, from our country. So she can rest assured, as was signalled, I have to say, in the recent budget, where we froze duty on Scots whisky once again, that we will make sure that we do the right thing 
by Scotland's most important export. Stephen Jones. Thank you. Mr Speaker, his department's assessment is that any form of Brexit will leave us worse off than if we stayed in the European Union. Will he simply confirm that is his department's view? Yes. Quite rightly, does not assess uh, staying within the European Union. And there's an obvious reason for that, Mr Speaker, which is that in June 2016, Uh, The country took the decision, 7.4 million people voted to leave the European Union, and that is an outcome that this government will respect. Louise Haig. Will Operation Stack have to be replicated across all major ports in the event of no deal? It can rest assured that a very extensive amount of contingency planning has gone on and will continue to go on in terms of the arrangements that we may have to uh, bring into force at our ports in order to make sure uh, that goods keep flowing. Alan Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <laughs> heard the usual nonsense from the, the bench is obviously about SNP bad for not uh, supporting this government's so-called deal. Yeah. If the deal is so good, why is the UK government not brave enough to take control and publish uh, evidence on the financial impact? Now, has he seen the analysis for the Bank of England that his deal will raise employment, unemployment, sorry, by 4% and inflation by 2%? And if the UK government does not agree with that analysis, why don't they disprove it by publishing their own evidence? Yeah, yeah. Very good. good. Um, The Honourable Gentleman suggests that we haven't had the courage, I think as he put it, to produce an analysis uh, of the deal as he terms it, and I would say we have done precisely that, as was required uh, by this House. A range of potential uh, uh, landing points uh, for the deal as as set out in in broad terms within the future uh, political declaration. The Government has done just that. Geraint Davis. Mr Speaker, the father of the House knows better than others that Margaret Thatcher was instrumental in creating the single market and encouraging Japanese companies to come here to platform into it. So given that the EU now has a free trade agreement with Japan and the government intends to Brexit, isn't the loss of uh, Japanese-based jobs and investment painfully predictable and isn't it incumbent now on the government to give business and the people and Honda workers and others the final say on it, whether this is really what they want, namely this botch deal, or to stay in the EU to secure future jobs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Um, what, what the Honourable Gentleman I think has overlooked is that the uh, trade deal with Japan has been struck at a time that we are members of the EU and the impact, uh, the, there, 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 will have, there will be an impact on uh, car producers and we've seen that as part of the reason why uh, Honda has taken the decision that it has taken. The most important thing going forward is that we enter into an arrangement with the EU where we minimise the frictions at our borders, we have a free trade agreement with the EU 27 and that we make sure that trade continues to flow and the best way of doing that Mr Speaker is to support the deal that we're negotiating with the European Union. Jeff Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the government's letter to Nissan promised that their ability to export to and from the EU would not be adversely affected by Brexit. Now, how, can, how on earth can that possibly be reconciled with the Prime Minister's red lines? Well, we have a, um, a clear commitment to the Prime Minister. My right will refer the Prime Minister has a clear commitment to entering into. Uh, a, a future trading relationship with the European Union based on the political declaration, which has at its heart a free trade area, so tariff free trade, and also making sure that we have the customs facilitations in place to make sure that that uh, trade flows as freely as possible. Marion Fellows. And in spite of the benches opposite shouting SNP bad, I'd like to ask this question. The UK uh, Treasury analysis doesn't cover the PM's deal. It covered a no deal, a free trade agreement, EEA without a customs union and the Prime Minister's failed checkers plan. Does this mean the Prime Minister plans to ditch her plan for one of those or proceed? without knowing the consequences. Well, what the analysis needs to do, Mr Speaker, is to uh, model uh, the future uh, political declaration upon which the negotiations going forward 
will rest. And of course, uh, that uh, is a is a relatively uh, broad document with a number of potential outcomes. So what the uh, analysis has quite rightly done is to take a, a range of possible uh, outcomes in order to uh, make that assessment and most accurately reflect the range of outcomes of where the deal itself may uh, land. Deirdre Brock. Mr Speaker, unlike the EEA or single market model, the PM's deal assumes that regulatory checks will be essential to the proper functioning of separate EU and UK markets. Doesn't he agree that we need to understand the impact of such trade barriers now? Well, this is precisely what the analysis is setting out, is a series of potential uh, outcomes and the uh, economic uh, impacts thereof. We have an, some members suggesting that we should be analysing uh, where we are at the moment, but that would not be appropriate given that we are leaving uh, the European Union. But at the same time, it has to be recognised that we have not yet fully concluded uh, the uh, new trading relationship with the European Union. Uh, Union, the EU 27, uh, and uh, therefore the analysis itself sets out a range of possible uh, landing points uh, for those negotiations. Patrick Grady. A minister is actually starting to say and admit that there is no analysis yeah, of the withdrawal you. agreement bill. Yeah. So I just want to press it. The withdrawal agreement was published uh, before, laid before this House on the 26th of November. So on what date, specific date, did the government publish its specific analysis on that withdrawal agreement, economic analysis? And if so, what title or command paper number should I ask for in the vote office or the library in order to see the analysis? Ah. The, the analysis, uh, Mr Speaker, was, as demanded uh, by the House, uh, sets out the possible, uh, different possible outcomes, including modelling a range of options between uh, the, uh, those contained within the uh, uh, June uh, white paper of uh, last year uh, and uh, an FTA and uh, a point uh, somewhere between the two of them in order to allow uh, an informed uh, uh, look at the likely input impact of the various range of outcomes that are implicit within the uh, future uh, declaration. And he will know that that is of necessity the way in which this analysis has to be conducted given that we have uh, a period of time during which we will be negotiating a precise exit arrangement with the European Union. Kirsty Blackburn. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, this is Schrodinger's analysis. Even the Minister doesn't know whether or not it exists at this moment in time. Can he answer a simple question? Does he believe that the UK would be better off if it were to leave the EU with the Prime Minister's deal or if it were to stay in the EU? Well, Mr Speaker, I have been asked this question a couple of times and the reality is that that is a, an entirely hypothetical question because it, to end up staying within to end up staying within the European but to end up staying within the European Union would be to fly in the face of the results of the June 2016 referendum, uh, a referendum which saw a high level of turnout for any electoral event in our country's history, and this government is going to respect the outcome of that referendum. <laughs> Through Henry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this question was. Uh, was aimed at the Prime Minister, so I can only assume that the Minister is undergoing an audition as future leader of the Conservative Party. And on that basis, if he were Prime Minister, would he take cognizance of the LSE's published analysis showing a 5.5% hit on GDP due to the incumbent's plan, or would, would he, like her, simply ignore that? Uh, 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 what we must do, Mr Speaker, is to make sure that we conclude a good deal for our country. What we must do, Mr Speaker, is to make sure that we avoid a no-deal scenario. And what we must do, Mr Speaker, is to make sure that we respect the result of the June 2016 referendum. That is the mission of this country uh, of, and of this government. We are negotiating the final elements of that. And as uh, I hope uh, the Prime Minister comes back with uh, changes to that deal around uh, the backstop. 
If we are to do the right thing, the best thing for the whole of the United Kingdom, then we should support it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have to say, I am stunningly impressed by the Minister's performance at that dispatch box. You can tell a big Downing Street lollipop is on its way when that intellectual heavyweight from Bexhill and Battle is nodded in agreement with everything he said for the last three quarters of an hour. So let me ask, let me ask, him, let me ask him this. Let me ask him this. The deal ends freedom of movement, one of the reasons I won't support it. Where can I find the economic analysis of ending freedom of movement on Scotland, on the city of Glasgow, and can he also tell me, following his answer to the Chair of the Public Accounts Committee, that as well as the discussions he's had with HMRC, have Revenue Scotland been consulted? Well, on the issue, uh, Mr Speaker, of the uh, impact of uh, immigration, if the Honourable Gentleman looks closely at the analysis, he will see that now he will see that the various scenarios that I have outlined during this urgent question are analysed both in terms of the current uh, free movement arrangements and also in terms of more restrictive arrangements which would follow on uh, uh, will be expected to follow on from the negotiations that we will uh, further have uh, with the European Union but can I just make one important point very important point on immigration uh, which is there will have been a multitude of reasons why 17.4 million people voted to leave the European Union in 2016. There can be little doubt in my mind that immigration was one of them and it is absolutely vital that this government sticks to, as it will, its commitment to ensure that we put an end to free movement and gain control of our borders. Order. The Honourable Gentleman continues to chunter from a sedentary position about the merits or otherwise of lollipops, but when his <laughs> appetite has been satisfied, and perhaps even if it hasn't been, we will move to the next urgent question. Sir Edward Davy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Home Secretary make a statement on his use of the power to deprive a person of a citizenship status? The Secretary of State for the Home Department, Secretary Sajid Javid. Mr Speaker. To keep this country safe, we must be prepared to make tough decisions. As I told the House on Monday, there must be consequences for those who back terror. More than 900 people travelled from the UK to engage with the conflict in Syria and Iraq. At least 20% have been killed in the region, and around 40% have returned. They have all been investigated, and I can reassure this House that the majority have been assessed to pose no or a low security risk. Those who stayed include some of the most dangerous, including many who supported terrorism, not least those who chose to fight or to raise families in the so-called caliphate. They turned their back on this country to support a group that butchered and beheaded innocent civilians, including British citizens, that tied the arms of homosexuals and threw them off the top of buildings and that raped countless young girls, boys and women. I have been resolute that where they pose any threat to this country, I will do everything in my power to prevent their return. Yeah, yeah. This includes stripping dangerous individuals of their British citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. This power is only used in extreme circumstances where conducive to the public good. Since 2010, it has been used around 150 times for people linked to terrorism or serious crimes. And we, of course, follow international law. An individual can only be deprived of British citizenship where it will not leave that individual stateless. Where they are a dual national or in some limited circumstances, they have the right to citizenship elsewhere. Mr Speaker, it would not be right to comment on any individual case, but I can say that each one is carefully considered on its own merits, regardless of gender, age or family status. Children should not suffer, or if a parent loses, so if a parent does lose their British citizenship, it does not affect the rights of their child. Deprivation is a powerful tool that can only be used to keep the most dangerous individuals out of this country, and we do not use it lightly. 
But when someone turns their back on the fundamental... ...he must use to make such judgments on the public good. As the Home Secretary knows, the law prevents him from making someone who is British by birth stateless. In November, the Home Secretary lost a case before the Special Immigration Appeals Commission on a similar decision made by his predecessor to strip two terror suspects of British citizenship. Then, as now, the Home Office contended that the two had Bangladeshi citizenship by descent, but the court ruled that was not the case, and that stripping them of British citizenship was therefore unlawful. Can the Home Secretary tell the House what changes have been made to the decision-making process since that case that give him confidence that he is acting lawfully now? In removing British citizenship, the Home Secretary is essentially saying she is somebody else's problem. But in the words of the former Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, which other country is supposed to look after her on our behalf? Can you imagine the fury here if we took a French or Italian citizen who joined Islamic State? Mr Speaker, surely a British citizen born in Britain is a British responsibility. The Home Secretary mentioned national security in his answer. Can he explain what evidence he used to conclude that this 19-year-old mother and her newborn baby would be a threat to national security? Will the Home Secretary confirm that the evidence required to prosecute Ms Begum for supporting terrorism is readily available from the media? And so will he explain why he is so unwilling to bring her to justice? Finally, can he please tell the House what he expects to happen to Ms Begum's newborn baby boy? This child is an innocent British citizen and we have a clear responsibility to ensure his well-being. What steps is he taking to uphold that important responsibility? Uh, Mr Speaker, can I thank the one honourable gentleman uh, for his questions? And and I want to uh, go through uh, those, but let me just say to him and the House, these decisions are never taken lightly. And that's not just uh, speaking for myself, but this, uh, this has been a power that has been in place for more than 100 years... It was uh, set out uh, properly in the 1981 British Nationality Act, and since then it has been used by successive Home Secretaries. And whilst I won't know every decision that every Home Secretary made in the past, what I can be certain of is that no Home Secretary would have taken decisions of deprivation of British citizenship lightly. And there are a number of things to weigh up, as well as national security, moral issues, legal issues. Uh, Of course, all that needs to be taken carefully into account. And no decision of this type, as serious as this, can be taken lightly. The right honourable gentleman asked me about the the grounds for a citizenship decision. As I've said, I cannot talk about an individual case. But I'm happy to try and answer his questions. Almost all these decisions, and depending on how far back one goes, are made on what's called the conducive test, if it's conducive uh, uh, to the public good. It is, it is a test that a number of uh, issues can be applied in, in, in the case that is uh, uh, prominent in the papers now, but in many recent cases, including I think the ones that he, uh, the Honourable Right Honourable Gentleman referred to, are to do with terrorism and national security uh, cases. And uh, in, in, in each of those cases, uh, I would uh, look at the evidence that's put in front of me. Some of it would be secret intelligence, some of it would be more publicly available information. And that will be used to determine uh, the, uh, the threat that, that individual may pose to the country. And, uh, and alongside that, uh, officials from the Home Office working with other partners and partner agencies would put together a case, including uh, a legal case, to, to look at a number of issues, but of course absolutely make sure that if we go ahead and take such a decision to deprive someone of their British nationality, that they will not be left stateless. And uh, as, uh, with every decision that I am uh, aware of, and I, uh, and I can't think any of my predecessors would have taken a, a decision uh, uh, that could have been any different, that has been applied every single time. And unless our lawyers, who are um, very uh, expert in this field and would look very carefully at judgments in other cases as well, if they have been challenged, the right honourable gentleman referred to previous cases, would look carefully uh, into each of those cases to, to make sure if there are lessons 
to be learned, and those will be taken into account. And, uh, it, and when a decision then uh, it has to be made, uh, I would have to be absolutely, in every case, uh, absolutely confident that it is not only conducive to the public good, but it is legally proper and correct and compliant with both international and any relevant uh, domestic law. And uh, the right honourable gentleman may be interested to know that, so for example, on, uh, in, 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 the, in the case that is in the press at the moment, uh, I can refer to public comment. There has been a public comment already by Lord Carlisle, uh, an individual that he would know well, who has already reflected on this case and, uh, and on other uh, such cases that he would have been familiar with and would be someone who would be worth listening to in terms of how this practice has uh, taken place in the past. The right honourable gentleman also asked me about uh, minors, and again, I can't talk about any uh, particular individual or case, uh, but uh, if, in, in, in the case of a minor, clearly, clearly even more care must be absolutely taken because it is absolutely paramount in all cases to take into account the welfare of, of minors. And uh, again, I, I cannot refer to any particular case, but that is also uh, something that is uh, clearly also in domestic legislation uh, as well about the primacy in making any kind of immigration decision, including decisions related to deprivation, to make sure uh, that a, a, the welfare of a child is taken uh, into account where, uh, where that is uh, relevant. And, and if I can just say gently also, finally, to the right honourable gentleman, that he, he was in the previous government. He was a senior member of the previous government. He was not only in the cabinet. He was for almost three years, if I remember correctly, a member of the National Security Council. He would have been there in that council on countless occasions discussing counter-terrorism issues. It's hard, to, it's hard to actually think that perhaps the issue of deprivation may not have come up. But not only was he a member of a government that itself uh, made uh, decisions uh, uh, on, on deprivation, many on terrorism grounds, he even voted for the 2014 Immigration Act, which extended the powers of deprivation, and now he stands here pretending that he, he knows nothing of this and, and trying to play politics with such an important issue, and he should reflect on that. Mr. Kenneth Clark. Mr. Speaker, when I was Home Secretary, I didn't deprive anyone of their citizenship, uh, and although this power is necessary, it is being used with ever increasing frequency. Uh, every patriotic British citizen has to accept that we have fellow citizens who are extremely unpleasant, have very unpleasant and dangerous ideas, and we deal with them by the rule of law, international law uh, and domestic law. Uh, there are some people who are mass murderers, but we've given up transportation or exile as a response to such cases. So can I ask my uh, right honourable friend, as this woman is only one, actually, of several hundred who have already come back, and hundreds of various Western nationalities who are now stranded in Syria, is it not right that in, we should begin at least from the position that we accept back the people who are obviously British by every ordinary test of the world, and that others have to accept back everybody who is obviously a national of their state, because the threat to the future security of somehow leaving them to disperse from Syria seems to me quite serious. And we can use the full force of the criminal law, we must, and we can use the full resources of the intelligence services once they've got back here. That's how he's going to be able to protect British, the British public. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I first say that I always listen very carefully to my right honourable friend, and he's uh, very distinguished in this House and also a uh, distinguished uh, Home Secretary as well as uh, in many other uh, positions of responsibility. The, he's, uh, again, as usual, he's made a very important point, and, and all I would say to that is that there are, uh, each case should be looked on a case by case basis. And that is exactly uh, what happens in the Home Office, that is exactly what I do, and look at each, each case very carefully to, uh, against what tools are available uh, that, that will help protect 
both our national security and, and, and uh, citizens here uh, at home, uh, but also what can be done in, in relevant cases to help bring people to justice. I, and, and he's right to point out that there are many hundreds of people, uh, that uh, over 900 people, we believe, approximately from the UK that in recent years went to Iraq or Syria to join terrorist organizations, and many more from other European countries and, uh, and, and other countries such as the US and Australia. And uh, we work closely with our allies as well. And, uh, I, and I hope you'd welcome the fact that we are trying to work even more closely with them with the recent news, uh, more recent news about uh, Daesh and uh, how it is being defeated in that region. And uh, on the expectation that more people may want to uh, come back to the UK or to other European countries and work with them and see how we can coordinate and have a more unified approach. Diane Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the general question of returning foreign fighters and ISIS supporters, the President of the United States has said the United States is asking Britain, France, Germany and other European allies to take back the over 800 ISIS fighters that we have captured in Syria and put them on trial. Does the Home Secretary accept that what the security services have been calling for is a very specialised programme of questioning, interrogation, de-radicalisation and quite possibly putting these people on trial, particularly fashioned for this group of foreign fighters and their supporters. What is not helpful is to strip them of their nationality, which on the face of what he has said appears to be on a wholly arbitrary basis. And on the particular issue of Shamima Begum, there's no question that she said some very reprehensible things in the media, particularly about the Manchester bombings. But the Home Secretary knows that the Home Office has lost two cases where they attempted to strip people of the nationality on this basis of Bangladeshi nationality by dissent. They lost. Why is he going forward with the same strategy now? Let me remind the Home Secretary of Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. One, everyone has the right to a nationality. Two, no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality. Can the Home Secretary explain how his actions are not in breach of the articles of the Declaration? Uh, can I thank the Honourable Lady for her uh, questions and to turn to those. So first, I mean, she will know, as I've said at uh, this dispatch box uh, uh, before, that we estimate around 900 people have uh, at some point left the UK, the people of national security interest, to join terrorist groups in Syria and Iraq. We estimate around 40% uh, uh, of, of those uh, have uh, returned and approximately 20% uh, have died uh, in the region. And, uh, and of those uh, that have returned, in, in every case that we know of, they have been investigated, and, and where, where there is enough evidence, uh, then uh, they have been uh, prosecuted uh, for their actions. She would also uh, understand that uh, given the part of the world that they are in, uh, a very a lawless place, a very dangerous place, uh, that it is not possible always, uh, in many cases, in fact, incredibly difficult to gather uh, evidence on their, uh, on their activities, evidence certainly uh, that could be uh, used to try and have a successful prosecution, whether that's in the UK or uh, in other countries we work uh, closely with. Where we can help to bring about prosecutions, again, whether that's at home or uh, working with allies, where we might have evidence that might help them, we try to, uh, in each case, work carefully with them. And, and it is always uh, the case that the preferred outcome is always going to be one of justice, where you can have evidence and can be sure that there can be a, a proper uh, legal proceedings and proper uh, hearings. Our preference would be that uh, in, in many of these cases uh, to see if more people uh, can be tried uh, in the region. And as I mentioned earlier to my right honourable friend, we are uh, working uh, with a, a number of uh, other countries to see if there's more work that can be done together, because as I said this is a shared uh, challenge. Not just, uh, it's not just unique to the UK, uh, sadly, uh, across many countries, including our European 
and friends. She referred to the Right Honourable Lady to um, other cases, as the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, did as well. And, and I will say, and she, and she will know this, and I think she knows this, that you know, there are, of course, uh, at any time, any decision made by any minister can rightfully be challenged by anyone in court. That is their right. Uh, but it, 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 it would be just wrong uh, to, to draw, take one particular case that may have been in the courts and to apply that to all other uh, potential uh, cases that follow that. And, and also, uh, it is uh, worth, and it's worth me repeating, is that where there are legal cases that, that may uh, have an impact of presence or otherwise, that of course our own legal advisers, who are incredibly experienced in this and take these uh, issues very seriously, would of course take that into account uh, as well. And uh, the uh, Honourable, uh, Right Honourable Lady also uh, um, referred to the UN, U, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, and we absolutely abide by that. It's incredibly important, it's incredibly important that all governments uh, abide by that. And, and, and let's just take her two examples. She said, uh, the Honourable, Right Honourable Lady pointed out that the Declaration says that basically no one should be made stateless, and that's absolutely correct. No one should ever be made stateless, and it's not something we would ever do, and we would never take a deprivation decision if someone uh, only has one nationality being British nationality. We would not do that. We would not leave anyone uh, stateless. And uh, the Right Honourable Lady also suggested somehow these kinds of decisions are arbitrary. And as I have just shared uh, with the Right Honourable Gentleman, each one of the decisions is uh, taken incredibly seriously. The facts are weighed up on a case-by-case -case basis, and it is anything but arbitrary. <laughs> Dr. Julian Lewis. Speaker, may I draw the attention of uh, the Home Secretary and the House to an important article just published online in The Independent by the self-described liberal journalist Ahmed Aboudou, who says that Egypt play, paid a terrible price in taking back jihadists who begged to be allowed home after the Afghan and the Chechen campaigns. And he points out that in November 1997, 58 Western tourists were slaughtered in Luxor by returned jihadists who only a year earlier had been begging to come back. So there's clearly a danger in letting radicalized people come back. However, given that not everyone can have their citizenship withdrawn, and not everyone who has been out there can be successfully prosecuted because of the lack of evidence of what goes on in a place like that, doesn't the solution have to be a change in the law so that the act of giving support and aid and comfort to terrorist groups is itself a prosecutable offence? Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I thank my right honourable friend for uh, drawing uh, the House's attention uh, to the case in Egypt and uh, also for his, his question? And uh, you know, what he, my right honourable friend uh, outlines is that you know, in cases, again, I'm not talking about any particular case, but, uh, uh, but where you have cases where the only opportunity that you have uh, effectively to keep out a dangerous individual is uh, through deprivation and therefore prevent their re-entry into the UK, uh, then any Home Secretary would weigh up that option very carefully because ultimately my number one responsibility is to do everything I can to keep everyone who lives in Britain safe. And the last thing anyone would want to see, and my honourable friend has given this example of Egypt, where someone has returned that couldn't be kept out and then went on to kill, to murder and to destroy lives. And so that, that should be paramount in every honourable member's mind about their duty they have also to keep their constituents safe and, and help this House do so, and that's why the House has supported successive Acts of Parliament that allow deprivation, and as I said, uh, an Act in 2014, not that long ago, which actually extended powers of deprivation. That was the will of the House. My right honourable friend also referred to changes in the law, and I, I know that he welcomes, and I sought through his support, the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Act, which became uh, an Act just last week, and that also gives the Government further powers to prosecute terrorists. Janet Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let there be no question that everyone in this House deplores Daesh and this young woman's choices in going to join them. And of course, there are security issues which must be addressed. 
However, the young woman we are talking about is British. She was radicalised in Britain. Daesh is a worldwide phenomenon, but she is our problem. Why isn't the Home Secretary bringing her home to put her on trial here to be judged by a jury of her peers? Yeah. Apart from anything else, she may have valuable intelligence yeah. and yes. insights into how she was radicalised. Why is he washing his hands of this problem? He cited what Lord Carlyle has to say about this, but if he, like me, was listening to the Today programme this morning, he will have seen that Baron Anderson of Ipswich, the independent reviewer of terrorism from 2011 to 2017, suggested that we ought to be dealing with our own problems here. And I would respectfully say that there is nothing that the father of the House said with which I would disagree. The rule of law is fundamental to our democracy, and if the Home Secretary thinks he can overlook the results of previous decisions, I would very gently suggest to him that he might want to seek a lecture about the doctrine of precedent from the Honourable and Learned Lady, the Member for Louth and, Lor Lou uh, and Horncastle, who is sitting beside him. Because unless this young woman holds dual citizenship, he may be found to have acted in breach of UK and international law by rendering her stateless. My question is, is that a risk he's willing to take? And is he more interested in playing to the populist gallery than respecting the rule of law? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'll say a couple of things to the uh, Honourable Lady. I mean, first of all, uh, she, again, I, I can't talk about an individual case, but I, I will try to answer her questions. That, uh, every decision on deprivation, and uh, again, I, I think I speak for all former Home Secretaries as well, which under successive governments have made uh, decisions on uh, deprivation, that uh, it would be weighed up very carefully. Uh, the, the government and officials in the government, uh, given that these decisions have been made over a number of years, again under successive governments, uh, will uh, be looking at the legal case individually on a case-by-case -case basis. And of course that would take into account any judgments in courts that may be relevant. And, and uh, a, a decision like this you would not be taken, certainly would not be taken by me unless uh, the officials, my officials, who are the experts in the law. You know, I'm not proclaiming to be an expert on the law in this matter. I know the Honourable Lady is a distinguished uh, a lawyer, but I don't think she's an expert on this particular issue. But it is important to listen uh, to experts. It is important to listen to experts in this issue. And if I uh, may also just say gently to the Honourable Lady, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago that on, a, on another uh, case, uh, the, uh, that was uh, debated in this House, that came through an urgent question to this House, uh, rela again related to foreign fighters, the Koti El Sheikh case, that she got up back in July, and in a similar way to now, she accused uh, the government of departing for government policy. Uh, those, that, was, that was her language at the time, and she went on about that, about how it's uh, ignoring long-standing policy on death penalty. That was her accusation at the time. And she will know that many months later that case was looked at by the courts quite properly as is their job and they ruled in the government's favor on all five counts and so if anyone if anyone mr speaker is uh, trying to play politics with this judgment i think it's more the honorable lady well criticism by one honorable or right honorable member of another is not a novel phenomenon. Uh, I know what I've just heard the Right Honourable and Learned Lady said, but she has other colleagues who can pursue these matters in questioning, and I'm sure that she will take that opportunity. It would not be right for me to intercede at this point, other than to request that the House hears from Sir Desmond Swain. Yeah, yeah. His power to deprive is open to challenge, and in most cases won't exist at all. Can I urge him once again to arm himself with powers of executive detention so that people can be sufficiently quarantined before they're allowed back. Uh, Mr Speaker, what I'd say to my right former friend is that they are, you know, if, for, in cases where um, uh, terrorists or suspected terrorists 
are returning uh, to the UK, then there are a number of powers that are available, uh, including, uh, for example, the temporary exclusion orders, uh, which have been used, which can place a number of restrictions, including the port of entry, reporting requirements, and other restrictions. And we would always look to see uh, uh, first uh, what are existing powers that we can use. And if we feel that they are not sufficient, then we would always look to see uh, what more might need to be brought to the House. Vic Cooper. The Home Secretary is right to want to prosecute anyone who has been involved in terrorist activity here or abroad, and we should support him in doing so. But on this citizenship issue, he has said he will never make anyone stateless. But it appears in this case he is relying legally on this young woman's potential right to citizenship in the Netherlands or Bangladesh, and presumably on the expectation that one of those countries will accept her, even though she hasn't lived there and was radicalised here. Does that mean he accepts that the same principle would apply to other people who might be citizens of Bangladesh or the Netherlands, who might either have potential citizenship in the UK or actual dual citizenship rights? And if those countries removed their citizenship first, even though this was somebody who had committed crimes in that country, who had never lived here, that we would somehow be expected to accept those citizens? Mr Speaker, the, I mean, first of all, the, the right honourable lady, and I understand why it's referred to a particular case, and I, I won't comment on that, but in terms of her, uh, her broader uh, question, um, again, it's worth reminding every time such a decision uh, is made, it is done on a case-by-case basis, and, and, and it, is, uh, it is by definition each case is going to have a, a, a different set of facts, sometimes a completely different set of uh, facts, and we will take all those uh, into account. And uh, in, in every single situation, uh, we, there is no question of making anyone stateless under any circumstances. And, and not only is that, would that be uh, unlawful, but I think it would be morally wrong as well to make someone stateless. And uh, that is not something that we would do. And, uh, it, it, and, and in, in any case uh, it, that uh, I can give a short, certainly any decision uh, that I've made, I'm perfectly uh, comfortable uh, that uh, we, uh, the analysis is uh, done properly in each case by expert legal advisers, and that, uh, that uh, I wouldn't make such a decision unless I was absolutely confident on the statelessness uh, issue. Um, the, the right honourable lady also referred to citizenship of other countries and how it may work or may not work and, and, and she will know and uh, being uh, the chair of the, the uh, select committee uh, for home affairs she will know that uh, the citizenship rules can be very complex they're in fact quite complex in our own country in many other countries they can have similar complexity but what we do is make sure that uh, we have uh, work with lawyers including sometimes if necessary with foreign lawyers uh, to make sure that our interpretation of how citizenship laws work are, is correct. Bob Seeley. As someone who served on the ISIS campaign, I'm very well aware of the difficulty of extraditing and prosecuting returning UK ISIS fighters. Would you agree that the priority is the monitoring of those 400 plus fighters that are back in the UK? Um, How many of those 400 were actually fighters? Is the Home Secretary aware? How many of those people are likely to be prosecuted? And if he can't supply the information now, would he be able to give it to me or this House in some form at a later date? And would he agree now that there is also a case for an updated and renewed treason bill or act to cope with these sort of incidents in future? Thank you. Mr. Smith, can I uh, thank my uh, honourable and and gallant friend for his uh, question? And uh, as as I've uh, mentioned uh, a moment ago, we, we estimate that of the 900 or so that left the UK to join terrorist groups in, in the Syria and Iraq, that uh, approximately around 40% have returned. Um, the, in terms of uh, how many have been uh, prosecuted, each one is uh, investigated. Not each one, uh, not, that doesn't necessarily lead to investigation, but anyone who returns should absolutely be expected to be uh, questioned and, and investigated and prosecuted uh, where uh, that is possible. Um, I, I believe around 40 have been successfully prosecuted. And um, uh, some have received um, some very significant sentences. I'm aware of at least one case where I believe that a sentence of more than 10 years 
uh, for on terrorism related charges uh, was given by uh, the, the courts and uh, it, it, I will also look to see if there's any more information I can provide my honourable and gallant friend. Kate Green. Thank you Mr Speaker. As my right honourable friend the Shadow Home Secretary noted in Greater Manchester we have particular reason to find the conduct and utterances of Ms Begum abhorrent. We also want to understand why and how she apparently became radicalised in this country, as indeed have young people from my own constituency who have also tragically gone to Syria to fight with the jihadis. How can the Home Secretary assure us that we are taking every possible step to understand how that homegrown radicalisation occurs and what we can do to prevent it in future if we are not able to bring back our own citizens and interrogate, investigate and, if appropriate, to prosecute them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah, so it's a really important point the Honourable Lady has, has raised about we, we've been talking about uh, cases in, in this House that uh, people have raised, that honourable uh, colleagues have raised about uh, where people sadly uh, went on to join terrorist organisations. Uh, uh, but far uh, you know, just as important is how do we prevent that from happening in the first place. The honourable uh, lady will know that there is uh, across government departments, but including um, some programmes that are led by the Home Office, uh, uh, work uh, that is done uh, very intensively to try our best that we can because not many, that there are many people, especially young people, that can be seen to be vulnerable and they're preyed on by extremists. And uh, the, the first part is that to try and find who some of these people are, and that's what we try to do with the Prevent program, particularly through the Prevent Duty. And then in, so, in those cases, then to have a sort of bespoke, tailored program working around that individual. Each case would be different. In the most intense cases, they move into something we call the Channel program. You know, I can tell last year there, there were some 7,000 people that were referred to Prevent. Of those, around 400 uh, went into the Channel program. Uh, and, and it's worth pointing out to the House that in um, some of those uh, cases, in many cases, uh, those uh, uh, referrals uh, were, were to do with Islamist uh, uh, terrorism, but also uh, of the channel referrals uh, last year, almost half were to do with extreme right-wing uh, types of uh, terrorism and extremism. And so we want to fight all types of extremism, and uh, we work throughout the country, including in uh, Greater Manchester, and just recently, actually a few months ago, I went to Bethnal Green, actually, and looked carefully at the programme there, and I was very happy with what I've seen so far. Dr. Matthew Offord. Mr. Speaker, this country is admired around the world for its sense of decency, fair play, and the rule of law. And that's why I have a concern about this particular case. Can the Home Secretary tell us, because he can't talk about this specific case, can he tell us how many other people have had their nationality withdrawn, whether it's British or dual? Thank you. And, um, I can tell my honourable friend, he's asked me how many other people had their nationality withdrawn. I mean, again, it's worth pointing out, again, I know I've said it, but I don't think it can be said enough, that it will only be done in situations by um, the Home Secretaries uh, where they would have to be satisfied for themselves that it's conducive to the public good and by taking that action that individual would not be left uh, stateless. Uh, as I said in my uh, remarks at the start of the uh, urgent question, um, since 2010 uh, it, it's been used more than 150 times but that doesn't include, that number doesn't include, I don't have the number before 2010 at hand but it has been uh, used by successive Home Secretaries uh, prior to 2010 and the successive governments. Liz Savile Roberts. And I'm sure there are many of us here who will recall the, the attacks in Manchester. And I'm sure I speak for all of us that for the security in relation to these attacks and the attacks that we've experienced here, it goes without saying that that is a priority. But I do wonder why this Home Secretary can defend the, the dangerous concept of what is now effectively a, a two tier citizenship and to, to invoke the name of national security for that. And it's surely now. Again, thinking how people perceive this outside, this plays to the same sense of injustice. It plays to the brainwashing narrative of those who seek to radicalise young people in communities across the United Kingdom. And how does he therefore anticipate remedying the underlying causes of radicalisation when he opts to act unilaterally instead of making use of a rigorous justice system? Through justice, we achieve 
what we actually want here, a sense of fairness within society. If we are unfair within society, the Home Secretary loses the, the moral high ground. I beg on him to consider how he uses justice to best effect. Yeah, yeah. The, Mr. Speaker, I think, I think it's, a, it's a fair challenge from the Honourable Lady to make sure that we are, uh, whether it's me or ministers more generally, but certainly in cases uh, of this type, that we are uh, thinking very carefully about fairness, about the impact of the decisions uh, that are being made. The Honourable Lady, and I understand why, she raised the issue of uh, the, the people that, uh, that would look for excuses, try and radicalise uh, populations and communities. And, uh, and that should weigh heavily on any decision around deprivation uh, against the other responsibilities that the government has, which is to keep our citizens safe. And uh, it, it is also, I think, worth keeping in mind that Let's say that in a hypothetical case there is a possibility to keep a terrorist out of the country and uh, a Home Secretary decides not to for some reason and that individual returns and, to, and, and then continues to preach extremism, radicalise others, potentially even carry out ter terrorist acts. It's also worth thinking about the impact of that on communities and that, how that could go on to radicalise people. Henry Smith. Earlier today, uh, a number of uh, Labour MPs uh, said uh, that uh, removing uh, dual, uh, British citizenship from dual, national, dual nationals who are accused of uh, terror uh, offences and acts against the British state could harm dual nationals uh, who are residing abroad and get themselves into serious trouble. Is it not the case that typically countries deport back to this country British citizens who are convicted of serious crimes in those countries? Uh, the, my honourable friend asked, asked me about uh, deportations, uh, which uh, uh, you know, is, is relevant as far as uh, if we are looking at, in the case of deportations from the UK, we are looking at individuals uh, that for, for one reason or another, if they have uh, broken laws that we would seek to deport. Uh, the, probably the best example that we have in the UK is uh, deportation of uh, serious offenders, foreign national offenders, once they have served their sentence in uh, British prisons. And uh, on a, we look at each case by, by case, uh, but uh, where it is appropriate, we would look to deport. And it is also the case, as he's pointed out, that uh, if there are uh, British citizens abroad that have committed offences, that many countries, once they have completed their sentence, would then seek to deport them back to the UK. Khalid Mahmoud. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have been tackling radicalisation and terrorism since 2000, no, 2011. Uh, sorry, since uh, 2011. 9-11, uh, I've been tackling uh, radicalisation. What sets us apart from those radicalizers and terrorists is the rule of law, from their barbaric ideology. What we need to do is to tackle them through rule of law, not knee-jerk reaction according to the latest tabloids headline that exists. You've had the government had responsibility in the 1719 terrorism bill, not a mention of this at all in order to try and put the record. Will you have TPIMS measures? How many people are currently on those TPM measures that you're looking at in terms of people who are radicalizing the situation and what's going on with that? You have no records of people order. that are... I'm not order. I'm not looking at anything. I have no record of anything. The Honourable Gentleman has been in this House long enough to know that the debate goes through the chair. You shouldn't say you, because you doesn't refer to the Minister. You refers to me. And I'm an innocent in this matter. <laughs> Khalid Mahmood. My, my apologies, Speaker, Mr Speaker. The Minister has no uh, understanding of the tips measures that are taking place, how many people are radicalised and not undertaken under action uh, in relation to the capability of striking terrorism and radicalisation in this country. Will he give me some figures on TPMs and what control he has over those? Mr. Mr. Speaker, first of all, uh, I mean, I, I've seen for myself some of the work the uh, Honourable Gentleman has done, particularly in the, in the West Midlands, on uh, trying to help with uh, de-radicalisation, and I commend him for his work, and, uh, and, uh, it, it, and it's important that uh, him and others they continue uh, it, it, to carry out such work and, um, uh, and, uh, and work with local authorities and other partners in doing that. So I really commend him on that. He's asked me questions. Uh, on uh, the, uh, the, the, your deprivations generally. I mean, first of all, is, he talked about the rule of law. It is just worth uh, pointing out that 
of course, I mean, this applies for any government. Of course, we operate according to the law, and that law is set by this House. I referred earlier to, for example, the 1981 Act on the British Nationality Act. I referred to a more recent Act, the 2014 Immigration Act. I mentioned both of those, but both of those within the Act, amongst other things, they talked about deprivation. The 2014 Act extended the deprivations in terms of how they can be done. He was a member of this House in 2000. 2014 uh, as well. I'm not suggesting he voted for the Act. I don't, I, can't, I don't know whether he did or not, but the point was it was debated, and this is the law. This is the rule of law. As well as that, we have signed up quite rightly to a number of international conventions that we care really deeply about. The Right Honourable Lady uh, uh, mentioned the UN Convention on Human Rights. There's the, the Convention on the Rights of the, of, of the Child, uh, for example, that can be relevant in some cases. This is all hugely important, and we absolutely abide by that, and I cannot say enough. We would not make a decision that hasn't been looked at carefully by government lawyers, experienced lawyers that have worked for many governments and many ministers, uh, unless they feel it is absolutely lawful decision. That doesn't mean, I'm not pretending for a second that at some point in the, uh, that the governments can get their decisions wrong and they can be declared unlawful if they're challenged. That's happened under many governments, uh, and, and governments have to listen to that. But you try and strive every time to make a, a decision that you absolutely must feel that is completely lawful. And also, if I can just say that a number of occasions we have published transparency reports in this House on deprivations. The last one, I think, was May of last year, and that gives numbers, uh, your year-by-year -year numbers, uh, and we will continue to be transparent. He's also asked me about uh, TBIMS. I don't have the exact numbers with me now, but if you allow me, I would write to him on that issue as well. Greg McKinley. Okay. In fighting Daesh, we faced a new phenomenon. Phenomenon. People, through their own actions, deciding to join and embrace a new, however foul and warped, state. It was a matter for them to choose. So can I commend my right honourable friend for the bold action he's taken? And I'm sure it is action that is supported across this country. But can he reassure me that our position on these difficult issues will be one rooted in British values and rooted in proper judicial processes? Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to give my honourable friend uh, that reassurance. And, and, and he's right to the, talk about the threat from Daesh, and that obviously Daesh wasn't the first and it won't be the last terrorist organisation uh, we will have to confront. But what was uh, uh, un unprecedented, I think, in this case, was the number of uh, people that left Britain to go and join this vile terrorist organisation and, co and commit the, the most uh, horrific. Uh, crimes and, and, and either themselves or by supporting uh, what it has set out to achieve. And, uh, and these are unprecedented numbers. And I don't think any country that has faced a similar issue of its citizens uh, leaving and joining these organisations uh, has a, a perfect answer on how to deal with that. That's why it's important that we work with them, uh, and we will do that. But I can assure them absolutely that we must always be upholding you know, our values. And uh, absolutely, as I was just saying to the, uh, the, the question before him, we're making sure that every single time that we are acting uh, properly and at all times uh, within the law. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The actions and words of Shamima Begim are <coughs> reprehensible and almost undoubtedly illegal. But we are not to know because the Secretary of State has rejected due process and the law it is his duty to uphold and instead chosen to treat British citizenship as a privilege accorded to those he agrees with. Mm. He is also abandoning our responsibility to pursue and present, prevent terrorists made in Britain and in the process ceding the moral high ground to President Trump. Do, do his actions do justice to Britain or to his own political ambitions? Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady, I've had some uh, dealings with her in the past and she's a, a wonderful woman. And I think that she's a lot better than that, that question. Uh, that's not really, I think that's probably a, a, some kind of whip's handout or something. That's not her. And, uh, and, and she, the, the, important, the important part of uh, her question, of course, is that, and I, and I think uh, the, a lot of this has already been answered uh, during this urgent question, but I'm happy to say so again. Uh, of course, we must make sure that at all times that we are being both fair 
we are acting morally in, in, in the right way and also lawfully at all times. And uh, as I uh, said, it, the, it, when it comes to such important decisions as this, they cannot be taken lightly. They have to be weighed up uh, against the facts very, very carefully. And uh, they should only be taken when all other alternatives have properly been taken into account. Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Home Secretary has an incredibly difficult job because he has to keep uh, the interests of the public in this country uh, paramount and safe. But in this country, we have a fine tradition of not exporting our problems around the world. We have a tradition of trying to solve problems around the world. So can I ask the Home Secretary, does he consider that we have sufficient powers in this country to ensure that people that come from abroad who may pose a risk are contained? And if he does, does he also consider that it may be worse off for humankind if individuals who do have problems are exported to other parts of the world but they don't have such safe uh, containment laws as we do in this country? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend asked me about whether we have um, uh, sufficient powers. I mean, at all times, we, we, it is right that we keep the, the powers that we have under review, and if we feel that things need to change, and, and that change can be brought about, of course we would uh, bring that to this House, as we did very recently with the Counterterrorism and uh, Border Security Bill. Um, but it, it is also worth saying that you know, no matter what powers uh, you have, uh, because of our absolute commitment to due process uh, in this country, that uh, it, 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 any prosecution under any powers would require uh, a sufficient amount of evidence, and that is incredibly difficult in situations where people have gone abroad joined terrorist organisations and, and carried out the most horrific attacks, but then to actually have evidence that you can then present in a court of law against whatever power that you might have put in place can, uh, can be incredibly uh, difficult to uh, achieve justice uh, that way. And that is why, uh, as Home Secretary, I must look carefully at all the powers at disposal, and in some cases, and it is in, only in some cases, where it's deemed that the best way to keep this country safe is through deprivation of someone who has more than one nationality. I think that should always be taken uh, together as a serious option. Home break. Mr Speaker, could I just bring the Home Secretary back to the answer that he gave to the Honourable uh, Member for Stretford, who, who is no longer in his place, where he referred to, to the PREVENT programme, and uh, clearly the PREVENT uh, programme does very valuable work, but of course that, as far as I'm aware, is a UK-based programme. So the question remains, in what way is he going to be able to find out about the reasons why or how this uh, young woman, when she was a child, was radicalised? How can he find that out if she is, in fact, in a camp in Syria? And what assessment has he made of the risks of a large number of people remaining in a camp in Syria and the risk that, yes, they will, in fact, uh, develop networks from there and pro uh, provide us with a real risk here uh, back at home? Mr. Mr. Speaker, what the Honourable Gentleman that you know, highlights, and quite rightly so, to bring it to the attention of the House, is that as I said, these decisions, uh, they, uh, they are tough decisions. They are uh, decisions that will have to be made weighing up a number of factors. And uh, you know, the Honourable Gentleman, again, I, I'm not going to refer to an individual case, but he's talked about you know, people that may be in camps uh, abroad, uh, you know, uh, people that are members of terrorist organisations, went and joined those terrorist organisations, where we have limited evidence of what they, they may have done as members of that organisation, but we know that they've joined them. Um, and uh, it, there, there are risks in terms of if they stay in the region, there are risks if they return to the UK. I hope he'd accept that. There are risks both ways. And that's why each time the, the case should be looked at individually and, and, and judged on uh, the, its, its own uh, facts. Uh, but, I, but I do accept, I don't pretend for a second these are easy decisions. These are decisions that for any Home Secretary uh, um, uh, must be uh, uh, something that all facts must be taken into account and everything should be balanced out. But ultimately, uh, it is my responsibility to keep our citizens safe, and that is what must be paramount in my mind when making decisions. James Cartledge. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I strongly welcome the action taken by the Home Secretary. Um, there's been a lot of use of the word arbitrary, but surely the key point is this young lady chose voluntarily to go out and join and live amongst this terrible regime which has behaved in such barbaric fashion. And has he reflected, is she wanting to come back because she has regret or because she feels remorse or because the caliphate is being defeated? And my constituents, I think, would ask, why should it be that someone can choose to go out and join an organisation while it destroys, but be able to be welcomed back as if nothing had changed once it finds its downfall? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, again, the Honourable Gentleman would understand if I don't talk about a particular case, but he's right, as I've referred to earlier at the dispatch box, that we believe more than 900 people have gone out uh, to Syria and Iraq to join terrorist organisations, and um, and, and, uh, many of them uh, have promoted the fact that they have joined these organisations, and as I was saying a moment ago, it's hard to actually gather evidence on what they may or may not have done, but we know what the cause that they have aligned and joined and they, now, uh, and they, and they stand for, what, what exactly what their objectives were and the kind of things that, they, uh, that, that terrorist organisation has been doing. And it's also worth uh, uh, recalling that the, uh, because the, the Daesh is now a lot weaker than it was even a year ago, but certainly a lot weaker than it was when many of the people went out and joined this organisation two or three years ago, it's not surprising that those that are, that are there now that are, um, um, uh, are being, seem to be put, being pushed out of the region are thinking about you know, that, that they want to come home. And that is something that, that is a thought that they may have. But in, in each case, every individual we must know about, it is our duty and our right to think carefully about what is in the best interest of this country and how best do we protect our citizens. Yeah. Mrs. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've listened for the last while to many people, from the Father of the House to honourable, right honourable, learned, and gallant members, and I've listened carefully to the Home Secretary's responses to each and every one of them. But I still cannot get over the fact that the case that he will not refer to, as is proper, but the case that everyone else is referring to and the press are referring to concerns a 15-year-old woman, girl, who was radicalised, went to Syria, has, uh, went, went to Syria, has lost two children and is now a lactating mother, and she requires to have her citizens rescinded. Can he explain to me, because the, the, can this Home Secretary explain to me, because he keeps talking about security, in what regard Will she affect the security of this country if she is allowed back in? Secretary. Well, the, the, again, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the Honourable Lady will understand, I, I cannot talk about an individual case. I know that she recognises that. But let's look where, where individuals, where it's, it's self evident that individuals have voluntarily left this country joined a terrorist organisation for a number of years, been supporting that terrorist organisation, uh, I, I think it is uh, self-evident why that individual may be, a, 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 actually why that individual is a risk from the fact that they have joined a terrorist organisation. And as I uh, uh, said a moment ago, some of the acts of uh, this uh, organisation are, are there for us to see. Um, and, and therefore, hopefully, the Honourable Lady can understand why such individuals um, uh, could be a threat to this country if they return to this country, uh, and uh, where I have uh, proper reason, uh, based on the facts that are put in front of me on each case, and it should be done on a case-by-case -case basis, that the best way to protect our national interests and in particular the security of uh, people living in the UK is to exclude someone from re-entering the UK, <coughs> then that is a decision that surely has to be the right decision. Oh no, we've not got to points of order yet. But if the right honourable gentleman wishes to pose an inquiry, having consulted his scholarly cranium, he's welcome to do so. I wanted to raise a point of order, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very happy to wait until you feel that is uh, the right time to do so. Um, I, I seek your advice, Mr. Speaker, now or later. 
No, 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 no. What I was saying to the right honourable gentleman, I thought clearly in terms that Brooke did no misunderstanding, especially by one of his perspicacious intelligence, was that now was not the time for a point of order. But if he wanted to put a question, he could. If he wants to wait for his point of order, we'll all wait with bated breath, beads of sweat on our brows and eager anticipation. Meanwhile, Raymond Chishti. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having previously um, successfully pushed the government to accept the correct terminology, Dash to defeat the idea, the ideology, the appeal, which is sucking in hundreds of individuals from the UK to Syria and Iraq to fight for this poison ideology and entity. Can I ask the Home Secretary this? From speaking to Peter Newman, one of the world's best experts based at King's College London, he said the presumption must be for host countries to take back their foreign fighters. And unlike France, which is taking back 120 of its foreign fighters straight away in one lump. Will the United Kingdom be looking at taking them back in a gradual way, for example, those who assist the United Kingdom by giving evidence against those they've been fighting with first and excluding them until they do that? And linked to that, on the issue of revoking dual citizenship or citizenship of dual individuals, can the Secretary of State just explain this to me? Before the government does that, does the government, our government, speak to country X or Y from where they may have originally come from to see if they will take them back? Because if not, then they will become stateless, and that would not be what the government wants to do. Well, the Honourable General has now acquired the dubious distinction of being known in the House, I think, forever after, amongst other things, as a cheeky chappy, because he somewhat abused my generosity uh, in asking a question of that length. But never mind, uh, he's done it now, and uh, he can repent at leisure. Home Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, you know, each case is uh, looked at uh, individually uh, on, a, on a case-by-case uh, basis. Uh, the, my honourable friend mentions uh, France, and that, that is uh, after, alongside the UK, I think that it's fair to say the UK and the France have probably had the, the, uh, the most people move from their countries that, as foreign fighters to Syria and Iraq. So we work uh, closely with our French counterparts and other uh, European friends on uh, looking to see whether there can be a more coordinated approach to this uh, challenge. Uh, that we all face. And uh, in, in terms of um, uh, the, uh, countries, other countries that someone uh, may have nationality of, uh, we, again, it's a case-by-case uh, basis. Uh, what I will say is that we absolutely, as I have said earlier, that we would need to satisfy ourselves that they do genuinely have the nationality of another country before they can be deprived of, deprived of their British nationality. Order. We're deeply grateful to the Home Secretary and to colleagues. Yes, no, no, I'm saving the Honourable Gentleman. It would be a pity to squander him at too early a stage of our proceedings. We'll come to him in due course, but I think that the, the House is in a state of great animation at the point of order that's going to be forthcoming from the Right Honourable Gentleman for South Holland and the Deepings. Sir John Hayes. On a much trailed and therefore much anticipated point of order, Mr Speaker, last April the Prime Minister announced a children's funeral fund to give support and solace to those who've loved and lost. Uh, despite... Uh, the fact that the member of Swansea East and myself and others have raised this matter subsequently in this chamber, nothing more has been heard. Have you had notice, Mr Speaker, of a statement from government ministers? Or if you haven't, what further steps might I take to ensure that this pledge is honest and honoured? Because, Mr Speaker, no one should break promises to the broken hearted. Indeed not. And the Right Honourable Gentleman expresses himself with his customary eloquence. The short answer to the Right Honourable Gentleman is that there are a number of recourses available to him. One, if he believes that the matter warrants the urgent attention of the House, is to seek to use the mechanism that would secure, with my agreement, the presence of a Minister in the Chamber to answer his question on the matter. At the earliest that he could possibly do that would be tomorrow. It is open to him to do that. Alternatively, it may be that the Honourable Gentleman will take his customary seat in the Chamber for his usual participation in the business question tomorrow morning. We have become accustomed over a substantial period now to hearing the eloquent and often very poetic inquiries from the Right Honourable Gentleman, often infused with some philosophical reflections and even references to his favourite authors as well. And that's a treat that I think might lie in store for the House. Uh, Point of order, Craig McKinley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Last week at Prime Minister's Questions, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, 
uh, chose to mention my constituency of South Thanet, where upon, graciously, sir, you allowed me the very last <coughs> PMQ. I will quote what uh, the right honourable gentleman said. He said that the Secretary of State's decision to award the contract to Seabourn has increased the budget deficit of Thanet Council, the owners of Ramsgate Port, by nearly £2 million. Now, that figure was clearly incorrect, as in a period of just 51 days, that would amount on an annualised basis to £14.6 million, which represents some 70 to 80 per cent of the entire revenue of the Council. I alerted, as a courtesy to the Right Honourable Gentleman, my concern that he may have uh, misled the House, and I did that within an hour of him making that statement. Uh, I also alerted you, sir, to my concerns on this matter. A week later, and I have heard nothing from the Right Honourable Gentleman, and nor has he, upon my request, pointed me to the figures upon which he has uh, relied upon to make a statement to the House from the dispatch box. On that same day, Mr Speaker, he also highlighted, from his point of view, a fact that £800,000 had been spent with uh, appropriate uh, professionals on due diligence for the Seabourn contract. That, Mr Speaker, is again factually incorrect. That money was spent uh, uh, to do due diligence across the three contracts of over £100 million, not just on the very small Seabourn contract. I alerted the right honourable gentleman to my concerns both last week and this morning by hand-delivered letter, uh, uh, and I also delivered that same letter to you, sir. I note that the right honourable gentleman, having been alerted to my concerns, is not in his place to uh, redress the issue at hand, and I now seek your guidance, Sir House, to how uh, the error can be addressed in this place and what other measures I might take at your leisure, Sir. Well, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving me notice of his intention to raise this point of order. That was typically courteous of him. Moreover, I had noted that he had informed the Leader of the Opposition of his intention to raise the matter. Moreover, I am conscious, and it would be helpful if I were able to communicate this point to the Honourable Gentleman without the background hubbub of the Honourable Gentleman and the Member for Wire Forest conducting what is no doubt an absolutely fascinating conversation but which can wait. Uh, I would simply say to the Honourable Gentleman that I am conscious that he has written to the Leader of the Opposition because I have indeed received the copy that the Honourable Gentleman sent to me. The short answer is this. If the Leader of the Opposition believes that he's inadvertently misled the House, it's open to him to correct the record. Each and every member takes responsibility for the veracity of what he or she says in this place. I simply make the point, I'm not trying to argue the toss with the Honourable Gentleman, that's not for me to do, that the Leader of the Opposition may have a different view of this matter. His exegesis of the facts may differ from that of the Honourable Gentleman. After all, that is very much in the nature of political discourse and argument. It is a subject of dispute and perhaps of continued scrutiny. All I can say to the Honourable Gentleman is it is perfectly open to him to continue to write letters to the Leader of Opposition if he feels that that will be a productive exercise or finds it therapeutic. Uh, it is alternatively open to the Honourable Gentleman to take the short journey from here to the table office to put down some written questions. It is something I once did myself on quite a substantial scale, I can say to the Honourable Gentleman, so uh, I certainly would not cavil at him doing that, and it is absolutely his right. Meanwhile, he has put his own concerns and his view of the facts on the record with, if I may say so, his customary force. Thank you. Uh, if there are no further points of order, we come now to the ten-minute rule motion for which the Honourable Lady has been so patiently waiting. Ten-minute rule motion, Catherine West. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill that makes provision for asylum seekers who have been waiting six months for an asylum decision to be granted permission to work and for connected purposes. Yeah. Prior to my election as an MP, I worked for a number of years with refugees and asylum seekers who had fled violence and genocide in the former Yugoslavia. Those people left behind homes, friends, 
and in most cases their wider families as they searched for safety upon our shores and, crucially, a chance to rebuild their lives. In my own constituency of Hornsey and Wood Green, we have a long history of welcoming refugees. In a meeting in Muswell Hill led by Lord Alf Dubbs of the other place, himself a refugee from Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. and brought in 1939 to the UK by the Quaker-led Kinder Transport Train, the audience was asked who amongst them had a family connection with refugees. Nearly everyone raised their hands. A group of my constituents run Haringey Welcomes Refugees to provide a warm welcome for Syrian refugee families, helping with practical support but also friendship. As we marked Holocaust Memorial Day in Haringey last month, my right honourable friend, the member for Tottenham and I, gathered with our communities to hear the personal stories of survivors of totalitarianism and also to hear the stories of those survivors from Rwanda and Bosnia, those genocides and many who have found sanctuary here in the UK. And as I remember and reflect on the stories of those families, I'm immensely proud that my first ever 10-minute rule bill seeks to support asylum seekers by empowering them to rebuild their lives by allowing them to work and contribute to society. And Mr Speaker, I'm very pleased that there's cross-party support for this 10-minute rule bill.